Good morning to all of you and welcome back to the remote ITER business meeting. Uh, I don't know how many of you have seen parts of yesterday, so I'll give you just a little bit of introduction. The ITER business meeting is uh, an, an unusual thing done remotely this year because of the COVID circumstances. Normally, we have an ITER business forum, which is produced by Agence ITER France, and that happens once every two years. In this case, um, the, the meeting that was scheduled to be in person this year has been postponed now. Uh, we will have it in 2022, next year about this time in Marseille. And because we want to have more frequent interactions to discuss what opportunities, business opportunities uh, are available, uh, both through the ETA organization procurements and calls for tender, as well as those of our domestic agencies, we have uh, arranged this uh, unique two-day series of sessions. So today is the second day. Yesterday we heard an introduction from Bernard Bigot. We heard Christoph Dorschner, the head of procurement and contracts division, give an overview of some of the opportunities. And then we heard specifically about the hot cell complex, about the tritium plant, about the European domestic agency, Fusion for Energy, uh, what some of the opportunities coming up uh, are, are happening there. So we will now kick off our series of four uh, presentations today. <clears throat> the first one will be presented uh, as we usually do with this mixture of live interaction, uh, pre-recorded video, and then a Q&A session after the, the video, uh, in this case with, with Mike Walsh. Our, our presentation this morning is on the, the, to start off is on diagnostic engineering and dia diagnostic systems development and the associated business needs. So Mike Walsh, whom you're going to see presenting in a moment, was born in Ireland. He took a degree in electrical engineering and micro microelectronics there. During this time, as well as the usual engineering topics, he developed a particular interest in optics and lasers, taking the opportunity to work initially with far infrared laser systems. After his degree, he went on to follow his interest in laser and optics to develop a compact, high-powered uh, uh, laser system. His PhD work involved the study and development of various diagnostic systems. After this, he continued to work in the fusion field, amongst others, and led key diagnostic developments in several of the world's most exacting and exciting tokamak development systems. Currently, he is head of the diagnostics and port integration for ITER, and he is busy overseeing the work to realize the different systems to be on time, on schedule, and to perform as expected. So we're now going to go to his presentation. I would note, if you are on the event site uh, for, the, for the presentation, there is a place where you can enter your name and uh, or not. You can enter anonymously and enter questions. So you can do that during the presentation or at the end. We'll have a period of about 15 minutes where we'll, we will be joined live by Michael for a, uh, a further discussion. And you can submit your questions during that time as well. Thank you and enjoy the uh, presentation. Good afternoon. It's a great pleasure to be here again this year. Two years ago, we came to the ITER Business Forum and we presented many systems and today more than 90% of those systems have been uh, procured, are in procurement and uh, are already being built. Uh, so thank you very much. So today I have many other systems that I want to share with you and show you what opportunities we have coming. I am Michael Walsh, I'm Head of Diagnostics for, for at ITER and uh, I will talk today about the, the opportunities that are in this, this area. So I'm, my outline of my presentation, I'll give you a small background, talk about port plug assemblies, talk about port integration facility creation, this is called PIF, port handling tools, mechanical assemblies and electrical vacuum feed throughs, and towards the end I will speak about collaboration opportunities. So who's working on diagnostics, just to give you an idea. The sun actually never sits on, on, on ITER, as you will know. And indeed, in diagnostics, we have all DAs working, including now, we have a voluntary contribution from Australia, as you can see down on the bottom right. And uh, at the moment, we have, we have, as well as working with our domestic agencies, we also have many I.O. projects. More than 30% of the projects we are doing internally. Now, just to give you some essentials to contextualize, some of you may know everything about ITER and some of you may be new to ITER, so I'm just going to give you a very short introduction. So it's, we are planning to have a temperature of about 250 million Kelvin. We're going to have a field in the center 
of about 5.3 Tesla. It's going to carry a large current. We are got a large vacuum chamber, 800 meters cubed. We are sitting inside a large cryostat. A lot of neutrons are produced. It's got a very large plant infrastructure and long pulse operation. And for diagnostics, this is a new era. We have worked, I have worked in many machines before, but this is a new experience. It's a, it's a big step from, from what we have done already. Now, just to give you an idea, what you can see here is a picture hidden inside the magnetic field of what's going on in ITER. On the left-hand side, you will see all the magnetic field lines, many of them, and on the right-hand side, I've extracted out the vacuum vessel and, uh, and a, magnetic field line, a set of magnetic field lines. And you can see these lines, we have, to, we have to find them. And these lines are found by diagnostics. Without the diagnostics, we would not be able to make a huge plasma inside the vessel that doesn't touch the vessel and can stay stable for a long time. This is a typical scenario in ITER. And on the right-hand side, I am showing you, basically, a cut. The red line in the right-hand picture is the same as the red line in the middle. And that red line is what, what's, what's actually going on inside the tokamak. So we have to do that, and this is what diagnostics have to do. And, and more than that, we have to be able to feedback to control this in real time. So we have about 50 different diagnostics with about over 100 projects and all, because, of course, you have a measurement system, but as well as that, you have to put mechanical infrastructure, windows, and many other parts. And at the moment, we are in every phase, actually, from the beginning of projects to, to actually install the ITER projects, and I'll show you in a minute. We're known as PBS 55 on ITER, and our systems are broken down into the, the, what you can see here. And each, each uh, system has a nomenclature, A, B, C, D, E, G. So it would become F PBS 55 dot a, uh, dot a something. And so this represents all the systems. On the right, which I'm going to speak about quite a bit today, are the engineering systems, because we're now really at a hot engineering time. We are actually getting, doing a lot of engineering. And we have equatorial ports, upper ports, lower ports, windows, electrical services. This is a huge part of, of ITER. And of course, we have the in-vessel viewing system and the PPTF. And of course, another system called the Tokamak Systems Monitor. OK. But you know, I've told you we've, we've got things installed, but actually, we still have much work to do in all areas. And I'm just going to give you a few examples of work done, small examples. So here is uh, the vacuum vessel that many of you will already know and have seen already today. Um, but you will see here, I've highlighted some items on this picture that are diagnostics that are already installed in the vacuum vessel. So this is a great achievement. These go all around the machine. You can only, I'm only showing you, I'm only highlighting one part. This system has been delivered by EUDA. It's installed in the vacuum vessel. It's got all its wires and everything connected. So now this is effectively ready to go. Here we have another system. On the right-hand side of the picture, you will see a little blue box showing you a diagnostic system called the Neutron Flux Monitor. Now, the Neutron Flux Monitor is not needed at the early phase of ITER, but it has to go in here because it's hidden behind the cryo cryostat. And as you can see, the cryostat is already on its way in. So this had to be delivered early, and this was delivered last year. It's now installed, ready to go. So these are two important achievements, and this was done by CNDA. So I, I have no time to go through every other, uh, every other, other items, but just to give you two examples. So now what about engineering and ports in ITER? I told you engineering is playing a big role now. So here's a picture of ITER again that you'll all know very well. And uh, you see a person on the right-hand side moving. That's give you an idea of the scale. Now here, that red box is basically a, where a port is. This is another port. And this is another port. So these are major access points for ITER. And all the diagnostics, not all of them, but pretty much all the diagnostics are in these ports. So it's an important area for us. And we have more than 25 ports in diagnostics. So ITER is also an INB. And many of the components that we are building in diagnostics have confinement functions. Just by nature of the event, diagnostics are taking information from the inside of the vessel to the outside. And because of that, we have to, we, unfortunately, unfortunately, we have to deal with a lot of what we call PIC, protection important components. 
And of course, you know we have 18 TF coils and it lies inside a cryostat. Now to give you a slightly wider picture, on the left hand side here, you will see the, the picture of the machine that I just showed you, the tokamak. But on the right hand side, you will see the you know, the interface between the machine and where the diagnostics ultimately live. On the very right is what's known as the diagnostic building. So you can see we have to take stuff from the machine to the diagnostic building and then of course onto computers. I'll focus morely, mostly today on the areas in, in around the tokamak and particularly in, in blue. So this picture is, uh, is a blow up of the blue area. Now I want you to see first of all on the left is the cross section of the machine, okay. Then on the middle, there's this red line. I'd like you to look at that red line. And on the left of the red line, pretty much everything we do is in vacuum, has one set of requirements. On the right of the red line, it's outside the, the vacuum boundary. Different set of requirements, okay? One is called the import area, and the other is called the export area, ex-vessel part. It's important for requirements, and we've actually broken up the scope into those two different areas. Now, what work needs to be done? So we have the procurement and integration of I.O. port plug assemblies, and I'll go into a bit more detail on this. This is the ex-vessel part I'm speaking about now. So first of all, we, want, we are going to have a contract for the procurement and integration of the port cell equipment, into space and port cell support structures. I'll show you a picture in a moment. But this basically is going to consist of manufacturing of steel equipment, which is, contains SL, uh, stainless steel 316, pre-assembly, and the steel work, just to give you an idea, is about 15 tons for the ISS, into space support structure, and about 11 tons for the PCSS, which is the port cell support structure. And this is an idea of the two systems together. Uh, on one side here, left you can see the PCSS, and on the right you can see the ISS. And in the middle, the brown part, is the BioShield arch. And inside that is a lot of diagnostic equipment. And you can see the sizes here. The back part is about 6.7 meters, and the, the front part actually is, is not so different. They're roughly equal. There are reasons for that. And the width is about 2.6 meters. And the height is about 3 meters. OK, so that's one contract. And um, the procurement now next, we have the in-vessel part. And the purpose of this contract is basically to, to prepare what's inside the port plugs, integrated assemblies, put them together. At the moment, we are mostly talking about um, uh, a set of ports, but we have the option to add some extra ports later. And the scope includes all the DSM. DSM means uh, Diagnostic Shield Module, and each port has three modules, and we have eight to nine equatorial ports. We have eight, and we have one extra that is coming to us very soon. And uh, so that's 27 DSMs in the equatorials. And each upper port, we have like 14, has two, two um, DSMs. Well, it's one big DSM, let's say. So we have a lot of this uh, equipment. And each item um, has about, uh, each DSM is about 18 tons. Um, and no, six, six tons in, a, in an upper port uh, DSM and about 18 tons in an equatorial DSM, and we have many of them, as I said. And just to give you a more detailed picture, on the upper ports, you can see the port plug structure, remember, is actually already in manufacture. What we're talking about here is what's inside the port. So on the right-hand picture, it's the bit, the, the bit that's to the left-hand side of the right-hand picture, okay? Then we have um, another, uh, some more arrows here showing you what, what those DSMs are. The DSMs are, let's say, quite complex structures, and uh, they have, they're made up of many components. And now we have designed many of those, and so we are ready to go out to take the next action on them. Okay, now, um, we, we need, inside those DSMs, we use a material called boron carbide, and we've tried to make it as flexible as possible for the supply chain to provide them. So what we've done is we've effectively made boron carbide chunks or bricks. And these look like this. Each brick is about 50 by 50 by 40 millimeters. And you can see it's got a particular shape. But the key point is we want more than 100,000 of these bricks. Now, they're a little bit special. They, we, they're boron carbide. We're, we're proposing at the moment that they're centered and hot pressed. Now, those who are in the know 
will understand this. But we need to have a low old gassing rate at the end. So we can't take very low quality. It's not going to work in either. There will be too much old gassing. So this is an important contract. Okay, now assembly and testing of the port plugs is coming to the top of the work queue because, of course, many things are being manufactured. So after that, we will have to do assembly. And again, I just bring you back to this picture. You see here the port plug, the interspace, and the port cell in the picture. Well, you know, in the end, all these things need to be put together. And we will reside in the building 55. Many of you who have visited ETA will know this big building that's on the far side of the site. It's shown here. And we will, we will go in this part, and we will have half of the building. And we will gradually occupy it from 2022, from the end of 2022. And gradually we will, we will, we will take it over for more busy work that, that um, when, our, when our work gets more, more busy. Next year we have two ports to start working on. And, and just to give you an idea what it looks like inside the building. So we have on the left, we have the port plug test facility, three stands, and I'll show you a bit more on those in a second. And on the right, we have what we call the port plug assembly area. This all together is known as the PIF. This is an important area for us going forward. This is giving an idea one PPTF, and this PPTF is about 32 meters by 19, and we have three of these. Now, you don't have to do this. This will be provided by Russia starting next year, but we will need to integrate it. And to do this, um, we will need the tools as well. And this gives you an idea of the tools. I've just taken example tools, and uh, we will need to make tools like this. So if you're in the market for tools like this, for manufacturing tools like this, you know, we have something that, that you could perhaps bid for, and it'll be coming up in the near future. And to do the assembly in the PIF, we also will need a team. We are planning to hire a team of maybe between five and 12 people, depending on the workload, but say six and 12 people. And uh, this team would do the assembly and the testing of all the ports. Obviously, first of all, we would do the assembly and then we would do the testing. And there may be a mix between the teams because sometimes they may be doing assembly and sometimes they may do, be doing um, the testing of the ports. And uh, this, is, uh, what I, this is the contract that we're talking about here. We plan to launch this in the next months. Okay, and, and the details of this contract are given here, but I, I want to explain that we'll have to commission three PPTFs, port plug test facilities, 25 port plugs, 26 interspace support structures, 26 port cell support structures, and this is going to be going on over the next four to eight years, starting in, towards the end of next year, and then obviously accelerating as more ports come. For the first plasma, we have two ports coming, but for the second plasma, we have almost all the ports coming. So we have to start our work on good time, otherwise we would not make even the second plasma if we don't. And we have a schedule for how we plan to do all this work. And you could be part of that. This obviously will be based on IO site because, of course, the facility is here. Okay, now we obviously need to be able to manipulate and handle the ports, port plugs and their equipment in the hot cell and around the port, around the machine. Now, of course, we'll be delivering equipment that works, and so we don't need this in the beginning. However, in order to be able to do maintenance in the hot cell, we have to demonstrate that the equipment we have is maintainable. So even though the hot cell is coming later, we have to now make sure that the designs of the equipment can, can be used there. So we have a, a contract for tools and port handling in the port cells and the hot cell. And, and these tools, I will show you in a moment uh, a, a picture of, but basically we will need lifting frames. Of course, these are a little bit different than the tools we will use in the, in the facility next year because the tools in the facility next year, they're not remote handling. They need to be simply, we will do them with manual handling. Everything is, is handleable. But in the port cell, in the port hot cell, this is not the case. And in the port cell during operations, it's also not the case. Now this contract is about design. You can see on the arrow on the top, this is for the design, because the manufacturing is not going to be needed for some time. But the design is needed now, and that's why we're launching it in the middle of 21. Okay, and this gives you an idea of what these tools look like. This is some examples we've been uh, working on. So this shows you a tool for um, lifting the first wall, and on the right hand side, we have a tool for lifting the DSM, a diagnostic shield module that goes into a port. 
Okay, this is another tool which is able to do welding and cutting in the port cell. So we need to be able to go down a pipe, cut the pipe, remove that pipe out, then re put in a new piece of pipe and re-weld it. So this is rather interesting. And uh, we've also got inspection tools. So this, this, you get the idea here, the tool is about 300 meter, millimeters long. It's about maybe 200 millimeters in diameter. And this tool will be to look at the windows. So obviously we have a design of this tool. So now we're going to something slightly different. We go back into the tokamak now. And down in the bottom of the tokamak, we have a lot of wires. And all these wires are there to bring out um, the signals from inside the tokamak. In actual fact, we're not only bringing out the diagnostic signals, we're bringing out almost all of the signals that are making, are, are collecting data inside ITER because we have, we have consolidated all the, the wiring looms in order to make it more effective and efficient. And now we're talking about the lower port and marshalling area attachments. The lower ports, which is the bottom of the machine, and the marshalling area because you know, we need to bring the wires from the inside to the outside, and there has to be a connection point between the two. It's not feasible to have one big long wire. You, so you have, to, you have to have a vacuum feed through, and then you have to connect to it, and we have to connect to it in what's called the marshalling area. So I'll show you a little bit about this now. Now, just to give you an idea of, of these tools, you have cable clamping and connections. So these cables that we're talking about here are of the order of 5 to 10 millimeters. So you can get an idea you can see here at the bottom left in the green, you see many cables stacked up together. So this would be, as we are starting to come out of the machine, we're collecting together many wires. These are all mineral insulated cables. And when they all collect together, we have to join them and make sure that there's some cooling in those cables and that they're robust. Also in the second box, uh, just in the, in the bottom, um, it says pressure gauge connector. We have wires going into that box, wires from the pressure gauge, and wires from the feed through and they will connect together in the box and then they will be obviously joined and that's, that should be it. And as you go to the right, you will find other cable attachments to the machine. Now we have many, many cables and because of that we have many components. Uh, here now you can get maybe a better idea on the top left of a marshalling area plate. So you have uh, cables coming into it and cables going out of it and, and they're all managed. And these are, look similar to what we had on, on the other page. You can get an idea of the size of these areas. This is just inside the machine. So all this has to have vacuum compatibility. It has to be robust, tolerate high heat loads, not be radioactive. There are many requirements, of course, which will all be written down. And uh, then we have about 3,600 multi-piece assemblies with clamps, connectors, and about 9,200 single-piece clips. And we plan to launch this in around the middle of 21. And, uh, the uh, uh, and the anticipated contract type is a call for tender. Now we have other systems, cri um, cryostat electrical feed-throughs. And uh, these feed-throughs go obviously between one boundary and the other, between the air and the vacuum. So these are not the main plasma vacuum. These are to the cryostat vacuum, which is a little bit different. So it does simplify it a bit. But still, okay, we need to have it, we need to have high quality on this. So they have high, high HV, um, high vacuum, so you have to be able to work in a clean environment. You have high quality components, uh, need to follow quality class two. They're actually non-PIC sick, they're non-nuclear safety components because they're not on the first boundary. Um, material supply is low impurity stainless steel because of course they are still in the zone where the neutrons are. And uh, we have some actually possible off the shelf components for the electrical feed through part. So you imagine a big flange, I will show you in a moment. And the key activities here are machining, welding inspection, helium leak testing, electrical connections and testing. And this gives you an idea of the, of the, of the components. So the, the size is about 230 diameter and about 630 millimeters long. And you can see on the left the component, and on the right you can see it going through the cryostat boundary. This has to be, obviously, it has to be reliable. But it all, there are other, other items inside it as well. Some of them are carrying thermocouple um, cables, 
And as a result of that, they have to be matched between inside and outside. Otherwise, you would get delta thermocouples in the boundary, and that we can't, we can't have because we need accurate uh, thermometer readings. So this, uh, we have about 10 assemblies in total, and uh, this, this contract launch date is roughly in the middle of 22, so it's coming up next year. Okay, we have also got high-power RF feed-throughs, and these are to put in several hundred watts inside the machine. Now on the right-hand side, I have put quite a bit of detail. I'm not going to go through it all today, but if you have uh, an interest, you can have a look at the slide or stop the video and see um, whether you can provide this, this component or not. Now, clearly, this component, we have, this component is going to go from the back of the port plug, inside the back of the port plug, to a component inside the port plug. So it's, it's got mineral insulated cable, it's got vacuum requirements, ultra high vacuum, it's got to be leak tight. It's got a tolerated temperature of about 300, 350 degrees uh, with many thermal cycles. It's got to have some other, other requirements. In some ways, we want this to be simple and robust. On the other hand, it's obviously carrying precious signals from the tokamak to the outside world. Okay, I think if you're interested in this area, you will, you will understand. These are RF power connectors. We're operating in the regions of uh, tens of megahertz of, of uh, ten, tens of megahertz. That is the frequency we are putting through the cable. Now I'll speak briefly about the multi-connection vacuum feed through. This is, this is a different story. This connection feed through, the previous one, was for the cryostat. This one is for going into the ports. So each port, as I told you, has a lot of diagnostic equipment, but you know, we make lovely signals, we get lovely signals from the tokamak, but unless we have some way of taking these signals out, we're in big trouble. So we have to take them through vacuum feed-through. And the vacuum feed-through, we cannot have a million vacuum feed-throughs in the back of the port. So we're making what we call a multi-connection vacuum feed-through. So we're actually taking out many different types of signals at the same time in this multi-connection feed-through. And this feed-through, looks a bit like this, okay? The size again is about maybe two to 300 meters long and about 200 meters in millimeters in diameter. It depends, of course, in the exact one because we have, we have a few examples. So as I said, they have to transmit multiple electric lines from inside the vacuum boundary to the outside through a nuclear safety barrier. And they have to accommodate different types of electrical signals, DC power, RF power, etc. cetera, uh, double confinement barriers, and they have to be remote handling compatible. Now we've actually, we are doing the design. So this is all about manufacturing. So if you're in the business of manufacturing this kind of equipment, you know, you should talk to us. Now have a look at the requirements in the previous page because I can pick up a standard catalog and uh, find an electrical connector, but it's not necessarily the electrical connector that we may be able to use. Now sometimes that's absolutely the case. So if you have this connector and it's a standard product for your fa facility, we are extremely interested, okay? Now we will, okay. So now we also have specialized diagnostics, procurement and manufacturing service contract. This is about providing, um, let's say, human power to do design, prototyping and uh, manufacturing. So most of this will be at your facility, so either uh, it says here to diagnosis subject to extreme conditions. We require reliable design, of course, and this is achieved through a prototyping and testing activities. So we cannot just put something inside ITER that we've never tested. It may cost 50 million euros to get that item out again. If you have to take out the whole first wall, this is a major, major step in ITER. So it's absolutely unforgivable for anybody to make something, never test it, put it inside ITER. That's a sure way for it, for it to have a failure. So we must make sure we do prototyping, we test, and then when we put something in, we are confident that it's gonna work, okay? And this contract will cover the services of experienced uh, specialized manufacturers with the ability to tackle prototyping manufacture, UHV, 
and ideally with some plasma diagnostics um, knowledge. Okay, and it will also have, um, I'm just putting more details here, manufacture assembly of mechanical diag uh, diagnostics, optomechanical, x-ray, high power microwaves, radiation shielding. You know, you don't need to be an expert in all these areas, okay? You just need to have a knowledge of specialized manufacturing so that, you know, you can pay close attention to the, to the needs. And we also mention about RCCMR, but frankly speaking, we will, we will give you the requirements laid out, spelled out. You don't need to, you don't need to read the RCCMR code specifically. We will give you the requirements, but you know you will be having that sort of level of requirement for many of these components. And uh, some more details here. We also some development, development of custom procedures for bending, wiring, and joining techniques. Now it may be that one of one company may not be able to do all this, but certainly we can imagine one or two, two, two companies two could join together, and uh, maybe three, and you would end up with an extremely powerful team here that can do this work. Uh, just to give you an idea what this looks like, so we have, um, we have examples. So in the top left, we have in-vessel looms. In the top middle, we have enough RF cleaning mi mirror assembly. So actually, these are mechanical components. So I, I, a good workshop that can work at, with uh, components in a clean way can do this. On the top right, you see prototypes of magnetic centers. This is getting a little bit more system now because you're making the metal parts plus you're doing some prep work like uh, um, doing some wiring assemblies. On the bottom left, you have uh, a vacuum window. On the bottom middle, you have a model of a shutter test assembly. So again, you're getting to system here. Size of this, you get an idea from the, the picture. So it's not, this is not huge, um, but it needs to be precise, accurate, and, and made correctly. We will obviously help with the design. And on the bottom, light, uh, on the bottom right, we have a, a hall sensor, which is, uh, going to, which is testing, being tested in a tokamak. So we need to make components that can help us with that testing. So you don't need to make the hall sensor. The actual sensors themselves are generally made in, in a different way because they have some specialist needs. And this is in the middle of 21 OC also. Now I want to talk a small bit about collaborative projects. I have a feeling that many of you here are, you know, um, working for commercial businesses and your interest is to, to you know, make the ma maximum profit, make a profit. Uh, but we also know that there are people who are interested in collaborating with ITER. And we have actually already several, we have a, several examples in Europe, in Russia, in Australia. You know, teams that really want to collaborate and they're prepared to put some of their money on the table to be part of the ITER project. And today, I'm also, I'm giving you an idea of some of these collaborative projects. And the first one I'm putting on the table is what's called a halo current halo coils, and uh, I start off by talking about Rogowski prototypes. So you can actually see the pictures here. We've already done um, some work in this area, but we, ne we now need to move on to do the final developments of these components and then manufacture them. So we could go out commercially, but in actual fact, we, are, we need to, let's say, we have a, an economic, uh, let's say a, a, a budget problem and so if we can support somebody learning from this kind of work and at the same time supporting the costs it could be a win-win for for both organizations uh, here we have what we call the diverter Rogowski and again you can see the green lines on the left and the green lines indicate where this Rogowski goes in the diverter now any of you who knows that know, will know the diverter will know the diverter is a very tough piece of equipment well, if you're measuring something in the diverter, you also need to be tough. And so this equipment needs to be tough. However, we've, we've done outline designs for this and you know, we know how to do it. This technology is not beyond many people, um, many companies, many uh, areas that, that we know in the world. So it is, it is feasible. We know what we want to do, and, but now we need to get on and do it. Um, the ideal collaborator was somebody who's prepared to support these projects develop the prototypes and then complete the design of and manufacture of both the diverter 
and the blanket Rogowski coils. And we have about 400 blanket Rogowski coils, and we have about 60 diverter coils. As you know, they were, we will launch them in 21. I wasn't specific when we launched them. We will wait for a while to see if, if we get uh, who, who is maybe the most, uh, most appropriate to take this work on. And then we would like to have them around uh, 2025 to go on to the diverter. Um, next systems I want to talk about are what's called, it's real, these are real diagnostics now. These are mostly needed for the second phase, but we need to start working on them now because we need to define interfaces. It's everything on ITER seems to be about interfaces. You cannot just leave something to be, even if it's not needed until 2030, you, you have to define the interface. Otherwise, by the time we get to 2030, it will not be possible to define the interfaces. It will not be possible anymore because all the other bits around it are, are already defined. So we have to think and plan very carefully now for all the bits that we put inside. And of course, we will share cost with these developments, but we need really somebody who can come on board and, and help us to progress these. And so the first one I'm talking about here is what I call the high resolution neutron spectrometer. And this is, this is very diagnostic-y, okay? If you're from a very deep engineering community, this might sound very, very uh, physics-y, but this system is a key measurement on ITER. It's going to be needed in the DT and DT phases, so it's not needed in, in, in initially. But the idea is that you look inside the machine and you have a neutron spectrometer, so you can tell what the energy of the neutrons is, what's the width of the energy, and from that you can make many key ITER measurements. Okay? As well as the neutron spectrometer, we also have what's called the radial gamma ray spectrometer. So this looks in the gamma rays. You know, ITER is providing rich information from the long wavelengths to the very, very short wavelengths. And now we have, we've gone from, let's say, the long wavelength at the beginning, all this heavy-duty metal stuff, to, let's say, a much more precise um, diagnostic type measurements. Precise in the word diagnostic rather than precise in the engineering sense. But these, these systems will obviously have engineering involved. So if you're an engineering company, you can play a big role in this. It's hard to judge here, but you know the eater on the, on the bottom, the green and blue bit, you know the size of that. You know the size of the ports because I just showed you. So you know, you're looking at something on the back here, the item on the back is, is that, our GRS is the second bit in and the back bit is the high resolution neutron spectrometer. These, these items are of the order of five meters high by about two to three meters wide, each of them, each of them. And these systems will need diagnostic precision at the same time as they will need somebody who can do the, the engineering of them. So it's a mix, right? So it's not just one, one type of person will be needed, one type of company will be needed here. It's a mix. And uh, this, this is equal, this will need to be strong, survive forces, but remember, it's outside the vacuum. Because it's outside the vacuum, you know, we get away with many things. It's also, because it's neutrons and gammas, they go through metal, no problem. So we don't need any vacuum, vacuum connection to the machine. So we're actually outside the vacuum. We're looking in this case. So these systems have some levels of simplicity. However, the ports that they go into are rapidly going towards their final designs. And if we and the diagnostics in those ports. So if these systems are, are going to be realized, have to be, they have to be realized because they're really critical measurements, we absolutely need to start on them now to make sure all the interfaces are well defined. Now we've obviously started on them, but we need to go faster. So that's why we really need some collaborators on board, collaborators with some money, of course, on board as soon as possible. Now I'm nearly at the end. So I want to start to wrap up now, and you will see here the different projects that I've gone through. And the first project I spoke about was uh, procurement integration of I.O. port in-vessel work. And we plan to launch this in the middle of 21, approximately, and it's budget category C. So that for those of you in the know and understand what this code means, you have an idea of the size of this project, according to us. The second one, is the in-vessel um, procurement and integration work that I, I described. This is again in the middle of 21, 
and it's a category D work. Then we have the boron carbide shielding blocks, and as I showed you, we need quite a few of those shielding blocks. And we plan to launch that again um, in Q2 2021. Sorry, Q1 2022, forgive me. And these are category C, okay? It's important to pay attention to what we are asking for because sometimes you may not have it immediately in your company and you may need to do some, some, uh, some minor developments. Okay, the next contract is the engineering design of port plug integration facility and tooling. This again is in the middle of 21 and it's category B. Then um, we talk about the PIF service and management. It's a category C contract and it'll be launched in, in, in uh, Q1 22. Uh, we have, I spoke about two types of tools just to avoid confusing people. We have tools for port handling in the port cells and the hot cell. This we also plan to launch this year. This is the design of the tools, just keep in mind, design of the tools. This is a category A contract. And we also have design of tools for of other port handling tools, which is in the PIF area. And this is also a category A and we plan to launch it this year. I explained why we need to launch these. We are finalizing designs. We need to make absolutely sure that this equipment that we have, we're designing, that we have tools that can manage it. So it's, it's chicken and egg. We can't wait until the end. Then we have the manufacturing of the cryostat electric feed throughs, electrical feed throughs. We plan to launch that in early 22. It's now aiming towards its, it's going through its design phases rapidly, and it's a category A contract. Then we have um, coaxial mineral insulated cables for high RF power. I dwelt on those for a while. We plan to launch those pretty much immediately. So if your company does this kind of stuff, we'd like to know about it straight away. It's a category, category B contract. And then uh, I spoke about um, a, syst a, a diagnostic systems prototyping manufacturing contract. This we would be looking at some specialized companies. Um, it's Q221, we plan to launch it very soon, and it's also a category, category B contract. So now I'm getting close to the end, and I get towards my summary. So I hope I gave you the impression that we are advancing on many fronts, and I showed you that we have some systems delivered. I want to just say for those people who are out there who have delivered something that I didn't show, I apologize in advance, but I have only a certain amount of time and I have to try to keep to it. So I just picked two of the ones that are, let's say, hot at the moment. But uh, if you have delivered stuff, we fully we, we acknowledge it and it's absolutely great and thank you very much and keep, keep pushing it on. Um, we have many ta ta um, technical challenges being addressed. I would I would say systematically, and we try to address them, we try to make mock-ups, we try to make prototypes, and then obviously we have stuff that we can deliver. Now, two years ago, I couldn't really say this, two years ago, we were on the verge of having the compon first components delivered, or maybe some, some components were delivered. But at this stage now, this last year particularly, it's been an incredibly busy year on ITER. We've managed to have stuff delivered and installed. And it's really important for us because we've taken systems almost all the way through their cycle. Obviously the next part will be the commissioning and the testing, but that's going to come in due course. But actually we've already been doing some commissioning as we go along because clearly we're not going to install diagnostics in the machine that will be hidden and not test the bits that we have installed. So we're always, we're always doing testing as we go along. We're doing pre, you know, system test, subsystem, sub subsystem testing. You know, you want to make sure that when you connect it up on the outside that it works and not we're not like we're surprised when it doesn't work when everything else is put together. So we, we have we have you know quite a systematic approach to doing to doing this work. When I'm speaking about we here, I'm talking about the people in IO and all the extended team that's working around the world. We have a lot of dedicated people who are doing a lot of work to make sure that the stuff for diagnostics and of course the rest of the machine, but I'm focusing on diagnostics, diagnostics ports and all the stuff area that I talk about, are moving in the right direction. We have many challenges and therefore there are many opportunities for external companies to make substantial contributions. 
I showed you many contracts that we plan to launch quite soon, some next year. I hope I, I try to take the time to explain to you what these contracts are. I know it's probably not enough to give you full details, but I hope that those of you who are in those particular areas will quickly catch what I'm on about and we can find ways to follow up on this. Um, you can have one-to-ones or you know, you know how to get in touch with ITRA and we will, we will try to make sure that companies are uniformly informed and also um, properly informed. And uh, I would say almost all the contracts outlined are imminent. And so with that, I come close to the end and I thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Mike, for the, uh, for the presentation. I think it gave quite comprehensive coverage of the, of the diagnostics scope. Um, I'm lucky to have Mike now with me, Mike Walsh here with me in the studio, and uh, we, will, we will get to some of your questions. I would say at the opening that a question we get quite frequently, particularly for those of you who may have not watched all the sessions, is, that, is uh, whether these presentations will be available after uh, the, the, uh, the remote ITER business meeting, and the answer is yes. This afternoon at the end, when we finish with our last presentation, we will, have, uh, we will upload all of the presentations as well as the video. And you can also watch the full video, if you like, on, on YouTube. So you will have multiple opportunities to, uh, to uh, follow up with additional questions or to re-watch something in detail if you need. We have a, a couple of questions that have come in for Michael. Um, I'll start with uh, one related to the uh, procurement and integration of each organization port plugs. The, the question came in saying, in relation to this, procurement and integration of I.O. port plugs, how sensitive would you consider having knowledge on diagnostics? Will references related to optics and laser be required, or can we consider this as mainly mechanical integration? Uh, it's mainly mechanical integration. You would have to be able to communicate with the teams who are designing the optics and, and lasers and make sure that you pay attention to their needs in the, in the global integration. Okay. Thank you. Uh, another question. Regarding the cables you are looking to procure, would they require coolant flowing through the cable assembly? And if so, would umbilicals be something you are interested in rather than discrete cables? Uh, the cables that I'm particularly speaking about are typically mineral insulated cables with a, a core, a, a, a solid core. And they're usually relatively small, like say several millimeters, like four or five millimeters. And they don't need cooling in the centers of the cables. They are not like the cables for the high current components that we have on ITER. These cables need to be cooled, but they're cooled by attaching them to the vessel. Uh -huh. So they, are, they, they, don't need, they don't need a classic center cooling. Okay, thank you. Uh, third question, in relation to, again, the engineering design of port integration facility and tooling, this contract, is it your intention to split the scope into uh, lots? At the moment, it is not our intention to split the scope into lots. We, we, may, we may make it as a framework contract, which is not the same as lots. Okay. Uh, a following question. How will the diagnostic neutral beam injector be addressed uh, in this meeting? So, uh, I, go ahead. I think that, that's, uh, that's not in my area, this scope. I can, I can speak a little bit about it, but I, I think it's not been covered in this particular session, right? Yeah, I could follow with that by saying that we've, we've not had, in the, in the two-day sessions, we've tried to look at some of the main topics. That's not one that we've covered. However, uh, if you go to Christoph Dorschner's opening session yesterday, where he had the broad overview of contracts, what you will see is that um, he explains in detail how to access the ITER procurements page, how to look at each of the upcoming pieces, and who contact points are for these various areas. So on that, I, that would be the, the best route, I think, to, uh, to get a specific uh, additional information and follow-up inquiry. But we will not have, as Mike said, a, a uh, specific uh, topic on, or uh, presentation on that topic during this. Um, 
Another question coming in. I'm not sure if this will be in your area, Mike, again. Where can we learn about the meeting of budget category? Uh, I think that again is uh, Christoph, and maybe uh, Li Jun could maybe say. Okay, so we're lucky to have in the studio uh, Mr. Liu Li Jun. Liu, if you would like to uh, join us on stage, uh, who comes as a procurement officer that does a lot of the work in, in, uh, in diagnostics, among other things. So I'll repeat that. Uh, where can we learn about the, meeting, the meaning of the budget category? Yeah. In fact, uh, as presented by Mr. Christoph Toshner yesterday, you can go to the ETER website for the procurement section. Over there, you can see all the definitions about the categories. Each letter represents a range of value. So you can identify those on the website. Thank you. To follow on that, one of the other things Christoph mentioned, because we had specific questions on this, people writing in and saying, how can we, how can we know about a specific uh, cost, you know, what, what, how do we learn more about the specific cost range so we don't, you know, so that we know that we are in the right range? And, and Christoph's answer to that was generally, uh, we feel that if you are in a professional in the field, you will have a fairly good understanding of, of what the market value is. Um, you can uh, see these categories, as, as Lou was just saying, that show you the general range. But because under our public procurement rules, <clears throat> we have restrictions on actually publishing a particular value, we don't want to skew. Your, your application or your bid. We have uh, one more question coming in. What is the opportunity to have access to some of these contracts for UK small and, and uh, medium-sized enterprises, SMEs? Usually procurement packages seem to target larger companies. So I can answer the UK portion. Maybe Lou, you want to talk just in general about small companies joining. So I talk about the uh, small yeah. SMEs first. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in fact, for, for ETER project, we do have a diversified range of uh, different kind of contract values. So for SMEs, you do have the chance to work on, for example, core expertise, or you can work on certain RFQs uh, that we normally, the, the value is relatively lower. Also, for SMEs, you can work as subcontractors of the ETER contractors as uh, a second tier supplier to work indirectly with CETA. Good. Yeah. Thank you. And, and just in general, the, the question has come in repeatedly about <clears throat> the UK and what is the UK status and so forth. So to be very clear, in, um, in the ITER membership, the, the European membership in the ITER project is held not by the European Union per se, but by Euratom. And so that allows the opportunity for non-EU countries who are nevertheless part of Euratom to participate in the project. Switzerland, for example, is not an EU member country, but has participated in, in multiple procurements and, and, been, and you know, services and products based on its membership in Euratom. So when the Brexit discussions were going on at the end of last year, uh, it was very clear in the final uh, agreement that there was the political gr agreement that the UK would use this route, coming back to join Euratom, as the way of continuing to participate in, in ITER. Now, of course, that takes a bit of time for that protocol to be finalized and ratified so that the UK is actually formally joined to Euratom. We are in an intermediate stage right now. So in that intermediate stage, it's still possible for UK companies to, to look at tenders, to anticipate, to, to even apply. Um, there's no problem with that, but we are still in a stage where that would require ITER Council approval, ITER's governing body, in order to actually join. But soon, as we anticipate that the protocol will be, will be signed, then uh, the UK will be participating, any UK company will be participating like any other uh, Euratom-based uh, company. There's a, a question coming that is, again, I think this one is mostly for Liu. Um, maybe Mike will want to, co to, uh, to comment on how it <clears throat> applies to diagnostics, but I'll, I'll, uh, I'll try the question. In projects where you are looking for a collaborator with funding, how much of the funding could ITER provide? Would it be possible for a consortium of organizations to be the collaborating partner? How would such a consortium be formed? Uh, I, I, typically, it, it, the number varies, in fact. The number varies, um, but the maximum we would pay is about 50% in the collaborative route, just to be clear. Okay. okay. And, and with that, we, we then would 
would follow a special process for that. So if people declare their intentions, then we, we, can, we can present that to the Eater Council, get approval, and uh, then we could look to proceed like that. Maybe Elijah wants to add a bit more. Okay, I, I would like to just mention a little bit about the consortium subject. Mm -hmm. So in fact, for each consortium, there will be a consortium leader, which will be our daily contact for the re uh, related communications. So this is the major role, the, the, the leader of this, uh, this uh, let's say, package working with ETA. So as to how to form the consortium, it's really up to the consortium leader, how you discuss with them to share the workload, to share the package, to share the, the risk even, to share, to share the cost. This is more among you. And then ETA will sign, of course, this kind of cost sharing agreement with the consortium. Good, thank you. And I would also put in a little plug for the, for the actual meeting here, um, because we've had questions come in from time to time saying, how do I know uh, the, the people that I can for with whom I might form a consortium? How can I possibly know who else might be interested in bidding? And of course, again, under public procurement rules, that is not something we can provide. But if you go to the events, uh, the, the Remote Eater Business Meeting webpage, or you attend events like this, look at the participants list. You can see who the other companies are, do research on the other companies that are expressing an interest in this area, contact them. Um, we have had, uh, I think, on the margins of this meeting, about 200 one-on-one -on -one meetings. And those slots are now filled. Those, those will be taking place yesterday and today. Those slots are, are filled. But those are one-on-one -on -one meetings, you know, B2B, business to business, where they are con discussing this. So looking at that list will also help you to get a feel and inquire about how consortiums might be forming on a given uh, procurement topic. May, may I just add something on consortia? Please. I, I think it's very important that if you form a consortium that you, <laughs> your partners are adding value and they have capacity. We don't want to see you know, people add it in just to make it look look good. They they really do need. If I don't know, if you're if you're delivering a design, you know, the the people in this consortia, the each part each party needs to be bringing to the table something that they are going to contribute, <laughs> and not just in name only. <laughs> it's very important. Thank you. Um, another question from Michael. Um, while your presentation gave a detailed overview of engineering design, prototyping, and component engineering aspects of remote handling, would you be able to share details on your uh, remote diagnostics and monitoring initiatives from the perspective of control systems, software, and digital applications? That, 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 that's, that question is, um, let's say, going into some s specialized areas. but. You know, any of the contracts we have, we, we don't tend to break them up into one part or another in terms of remote handling or not, because the remote handling is usually intricately dependent in the components. Mm -hmm. um, and, but, you know, when we make a tender, we are prepared, we, we share everything we need to share. It's all, it's, we, we write down everything we need to do. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm not 100% sure of the basis of that question. Maybe if the person ask, wants to ask a bit of a follow-up, it would be rather interesting. Okay, good. And as Levan said, we have one-to-ones, and maybe you have already booked a one-to-one, -one and you could clarify some points. Or, indeed, you can always write the procurement after the meeting, and as you said, Christoph Darsner presented yesterday, and this would come back to us by, by a, a, a particular route. So there's a, there's a way of, of making this communication. Good, thank you. Um, the coming back to this question about the 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 eater funding and the fifty percent and so forth. There's a, a follow up saying, could you um, could you specifically address the point about whether the consortium can club together in order to provide this other fifty percent funding? Yes, yes. In fact, that's already happened, and uh, we have actually examples of that. And it was it was very creative uh, work done by some some of the teams, where they were able to get special grants. And together they could get the grants, but separately they couldn't. So in actual fact, it's no problem for us. Okay. So as long as the people are motivated and they they can, you know, they can contribute to that area, I think the the 
we could open the discussions, of course. Good. So we're now at 9.59. We theoretically have one minute left before we're scheduled to take a break, but we have quite a number of questions coming in. And there's a 15-minute break with our next uh, presentation starting at 10.15. So if you gentlemen will agree, I'll, I'll extend it at this Q&A session a little bit and ask a, a few more questions. Um, this question may have been already addressed by your comments. So just is there anything you would like to add? What are the benefits of a collaborative approach where I am helping to fund the project? Um, OK, I think there's one key point. Uh, uh, sometimes companies have a lot of great skills, but they don't quite fit ITER. Sometimes, uh, particularly in diagnostics, sometimes people think ITER as, as just one, one, it is one big project, but they think of it as one project with the same skills can be put into any different place. But you know, the, the skills for construction or the work on the buildings is totally different from the skills from the work on the, on the, um, on the diagnostics, let's say. And even within diagnostics, we have many different areas and different types of skills. However, we often see very, very, very good companies with really motivated people, but they don't have the skills in the particular area at the moment to transfer to those diagnostics. But with a collaborative approach, they could, there would be a time where you know, we would assess the, the companies, we would see is it feasible for them to make the transition in a period of time. So over a period of time, they could make the transition to being able to you know, educate their team, adjust their team, mm -hmm. and then come on board really strongly. Okay, we're not looking at uh, projects of six months. It's not, there's n it's not worth it for six months. I think a collaboration is sort of three-year type approach minimum. Mm -hmm. Because typically, if, if the people are already well experienced in, in the topic area, they could probably start from, from zero. If the people have a bunch of really good skills, let's say, that, that we need, but they are not currently oriented, oriented to ITER, uh, let's say to, the, to our area, then we could assess, but then you know we would give them a time to make the transition, and also we would be able to negotiate and optimize the team. Mm -hmm. So it actually, it's it's been a win-win. And I announced this first a couple of years ago, and uh, we already have some projects running like that, and it's it's like a dream. I, for me, the, the measure of success is how many emails appear on my desk <laughs> complaining about the project, and you know these projects are going very well. Good. So Great. the system does work, okay? And it's not like we will, we will obviously have to discuss and, f and, and identify, you know, yeah. but uh, identify the companies, but it, it, it can work well. Thank you. In your presentation, you mentioned mineral insulated cables several times. Is there a need of any other special cables? Yes, we, ha we, have, a, we have a lot of different types of cables, but um, typically inside the machine, the reason I mentioned it is I was, uh, I was focusing a lot up close to the, to the machine area, let's say to the central tokamak area. And in that area, things are, let's say, quite hot, hot, high, high, high radiation and, and, and various things. And as a result of that, in that area, we have focused on mineral insulated cables. But as you can imagine, to go from the machine to, to the diagnostic hall is, you know, sometimes one or 200 meters. And, you know, if you can imagine if we have 20 or 30,000 cables, it's a lot of cable. <laughs> so actually, we need a lot of classical cable as well. But I haven't, I haven't put that in because I would, the list would be, would be extremely long. But in fact, the, uh, the cabling in ITER is going to be centrally managed because for this reason, you know, there's no point in even diagnostics. We have a lot of cables. We have a lot of signals coming out of the machine. But Overall, there are a huge number of signals coming out of the machine. And so the DG or the project has centralized this, this work such that it, um, it's, let's say, more efficient for the project and more cost effective globally. So I didn't mention it. But the answer is, yes, we do need lots and lots of cables okay. of different types. So almost every cable that you, you could imagine, we, we will need. Every ca cable you could imagine in electrical in in engineering or in electronics, we will need different ones, except the ones up by the tokamak typically are a little bit special. OK. I think we have time maybe for one more question. Um, this one probably for Lee Jun. Would participating 
in a development with partial funding from I.O. result in disqualifying a company for, for manufacturing tenders coming later down the line according to EU regulations? I don't quite catch the point, in fact, with partial funding and... Uh, yeah, and I think, to be honest, I think where, where this yeah. question would be better addressed is probably through the, uh, through F4E, Fusion for Energy. But I'll repeat the question. Uh, I'm going to reword it slightly. If my company would participate in one of these developments with partial funding coming from I.O., would that disqualify my company for applying to manufacturing tenders down the line, according to EU regulations? Okay, so in, uh, if I may uh, generalize a little bit this question. Mm -hmm. If they are participating in the development, mm -hmm. are they going to be disqualified for manufacturing? Right. So if I may generalize this question, I would say to some extent, yes, because we need to secure fair competition and fair, fair treatment to different suppliers. Mm -hmm. So if one company is participating in the development work or the prototyping, they will have an advantage compared to the other tenderers for fabrication mm -hmm. in another tender. So generally speaking, those people, those companies participating in the previous phase of the development will be excluded in the follow-up phase for manufacturing. E except okay. yeah. if they want to also do a collaboration for the manufacturing. Sure. Yeah. So that's, that, that's, that would be then following the same rule as right. the first yeah. That's another scenario, yes. Which in fact is one of the scenarios that I, I've described because uh, we've already, we, are, we want to finish the design yeah. and then do the manufacturing. Mm -hmm. So actually the win for there is that if people can deliver stuff that goes on to eater, mm -hmm. you know, and it, it's, a clean, it's a clean path. Thank yeah. you. So we're a bit over time. I want to thank uh, Michael and Lee Jun for their contributions, Michael for his presentation as well. Thank you all for your participation and your questions. We didn't get to quite all the questions, but we tried to do as much as possible. We're going to take a break now, and we will be coming back precisely at 10.15 uh, France time to uh, hear a next presentation on the framework contract for maintenance services. In between, uh, for the break, we will leave you with a slideshow of some of the uh, lovely recent photographs from the ITER project, mostly here at, uh, at Catarush. Thank you.
Welcome back to everyone. I uh, am looking forward to now introducing a, a new type of presentation where we've, we've not talked about this specific type of contract uh, as we do coming up. So this is a framework contract for maintenance services. And to introduce this, as we've done in the past, we're going to start with a video presentation, this one involving three people. And then following the video presentation, uh, we will have a Q&A session where we will have the presenters joining us live here in the studio. What I uh, would like to do first is just to introduce this group. So the ones who will be presenting, whom you're going to see, are Mark Molera. Uh, first of all, he's the head of the maintenance group, um, so part of operations division. Maintenance group is responsible for preparing technical requirements, processes, contracts, etc., cetera, uh, for the future maintenance of Eacher's continuous and pulsed plant systems. Mark has a master's degree in mechanical and robot, robotized systems engineering. He joined the ETER project uh, two years ago in 2019 and has dedicated his professional career to the management of maintenance and inspection activities within the petrochemical industry. Secondly, Yo Meda. Yo is a procurement officer in engineering, science operations, and corporate section, as well as the, and she works for the procurement and contracts uh, division. She joined the IO in 2020 and is in charge of procurements and contracts for operations division, information technology division, and my own division, communication. And then uh, Joel Hortul is the section leader of the electrical distribution uh, uh, section for, for ETER. He's responsible for site electrical distribution from the grid interface all the way to the final clients, the final components. He holds a master's degree in electrical engineering and he joined ETER way back close to the start of the project in 2007 after 13 years in the French tokamak, what was at that time Tora Supra, which is the closest tokamak to us, only about uh, a kilometer away on the CEA site and now has been called uh, West since about 2013. So, again, during the presentation, feel free to, uh, if you're on the, the remote ETER business meeting site, feel free to start asking questions during the presentation as they occur to you. You'll, you'll see there on the site where you can submit them, or you can hold your questions until the Q&A session at the end. Please now turn your attention to the pre-recorded video. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Levan, for your kind introduction. Let us present our presentation. So in this presentation, we will talk about procurement strategies for maintenance services. This is the outline of the today, this presentation. First, we will uh, give you a brief introduction. And then we will talk about either context regarding current and future operation. And we will talk about three maintenance contracts. First, global maintenance service contract and the second, operation and maintenance of building contract, and then third, operation and maintenance of electric, electrical power distribution contract. And then we will briefly cover the computerized maintenance management system. And then lastly, we will talk about schedule and next steps. This, prese th this presentation covers all maintenance activities on either side for planned systems which have already been or will be will be turned over to operations and a facility management team before first plasma. Either has made the choice to subcontract the coordination, the preparation and the execution of maintenance activities of uh, conventional systems and components. As I explained in the uh, agenda, the technical parameter is split into three different parts corresponding to the three existing areas of responsibilities, which are global maintenance services, operation and maintenance of buildings, and operation and maintenance of electric, electrical power distribution. Now I will give the floor to my colleague, Mark. So to complement uh, this introduction or this, uh, you started to make, uh, the main objective of plant maintenance is to ensure and manage the legal compliance, the safety and reliability of both ITER continuous and pulse systems. And in that perspective, uh, plan properly maintenance, the preventive maintenance and inspection to execute in due dates plan activities and react quickly to effi and efficiently to unforeseen events. This means uh, to execute corrective maintenance activities. 
then a little bit uh, about uh, ITER context and particularly regarding uh, the operation division role. So the operation division uh, to whom we will ref we'll refer frequently is and will be the main user of Manos contracts. So the operation division is responsible for commissioning and temporary operation of all ITER system, excluding infrastructure and buildings and uh, instrumentation and control command. Operation division is also responsible to develop method tools, procedures, and define the strategy for the future operation of ITER facility. Operation division acts as a process owner for the preservation of all ITER components. And uh, within operation division, uh, the electrical power distribution team operates and maintains the steady state electrical distribution uh, and the um, pulse power uh, electrical network as well. Regarding uh, now the systems and over to operation current status. So while machine assembly is still ongoing, some plant systems have already been transferred to operation division for temporary operation and maintenance. This is the case, for example, of electrical power distribution network. Some other plant system have already been transferred to operation division for testing and commissioning. This is the case, for example, of secondary cooling water systems. After test completion, commission system will be progressively transferred to operation and maintenance teams for the start of initial operation and lately of the integrated commissioning. So this uh, handover process uh, will be sequenced sequence according uh, to uh, the, the schedule uh, we put on that slide. So the first period will last from now up to 2022 and will be a transition period during which we will keep on using the current maintenance contracts we signed a few years ago for um, infrastructure and buildings and also for electrical power distribution. After that, from 2023 up to first plasma, meaning around 2026, we will put again on the market uh, some other contracts to and to to cover the maintenance activities relating to the plant system we identify in blue color on this on this um, chart on this timeline. For the red ones, uh, we still have to make up our minds about the best strategy and how we will contract those um, those systems, the maintenance the maintenance contract for those systems. So, as shown in the previous slide, uh, we decided then to sequence our contracting strategy into three different steps. A short-term step, which, which will cover uh, up from, now, uh, from now up to 2022. A mid-term mid step uh, that will start in 2023 and will last till 2026. And a um, long-term period that will start in 2026. So the main target of this presentation is to describe the contracting strategy and to present the contracts we will place during the period, which is the midterm period on the screen uh, that will start 2023 and will last till 2026. So to dig in into the first period, so this is uh, the the first step was already started and will last uh, till end 2022. So for that period, uh, we call it a short term period. The scope is more or less fixed. Uh, the technical perimeter is um, made with electrical power distribution, secondary cooling water system and infrastructure in, and buildings. The main disciplines involved uh, for the coordination, preparation, execution of maintenance activities are electrical high voltage, mechanical, metallurgical works, facility management, including HVAC, and electrical low voltage, for example. The second step, which is really the purpose of this presentation, 
We start from 2023 and will last till first plasma. So the scope will progressively increase according to a ramp up a link to the end of our sequence we presented before. The period is uh, 2023 up to 2026. And then in addition to the plant system that are part of the short term period, we will add uh, some new cooling water system, cryo plant systems as well, and a few other things. The new disciplines that will be involved uh, will be mainly instrumentation, including met metrology and uh, analyzers, and uh, major e rotating equipment overall. For the next period, we call the long-term period or long-term step. So the scope will be the full scope uh, in terms of components that are needed to operate uh, the, um, the ITER facilities for first plasma. The period will start in 2026. And uh, the new activities and plant system that will be added to the scope of the mid-term period will be long-term maintenance preparation and execution for, uh, for example, uh, cryoplant machinery or tokamak's complex outage management. As new discipline, uh, we will find uh, plant outage management or some maintenance activities relating to pulse systems. So this is not uh, the purpose of this presentation, but just to present what will be um, the third step in the perspective of the first plasma. Then let me now explain to you what will, what will be our needs during that period. Uh, so I mean for the mid-term mid step or the mid-term period in terms of discipline and specialties. So we define um, mm. different kind of uh, activities as non-core activities for those who are on the left part of the slide, core activities in the middle and specialized activities. For non-core activities, these are activities which support the core activities. Uh, for example, we have some shared, we will have some shared activities or shared services contracts for scaffolding, insulation or lifting. We'll have also some uh, shared activities for the operation and maintenance of the electrical power distribution uh, um, and also for um, infrastructure and building management. Regarding core services, two main uh, categories of discipline. First category is maintenance of mechanical and metallurgical components. Second one is maintenance of electrical and low voltage instruments instrumentation components. Uh, for uh, the, the first category of activities, of core activities, I mean, uh, this is much related to the preventive maintenance on static equipment, rotating equipment, and we will find some uh, workers, uh, skilled workers as fitters, welders, mechanical specialists, or manual specialists. For the second category of, ac of core activities, we will find mainly uh, activities relating to preventive maintenance on low voltage um, uh, electrical e equipment such as motors or instrumentation such as sensors or safety systems and so on. So the, the workers or the skilled workers or skilled competencies we will have on site to execute those jobs are uh, electrician or instrumentation technicians, HVAC technicians, etc. And on top of that, we will have also some specialized activities regarding um, very specific uh, or skilled activities uh, such as uh, major or big rotating equipment or non-conventional equipment, uh, what we call first of a kind equipment, for example. So for those activities will be supported by original manufacturers. Um, what is uh, to be uh, mentioned there is that all the disciplines which are in the center of these slides uh, are, um, are, the, are part or will be part of the global maintenance services future contract scope. So, 
talking about this global maintenance services contract, what it is about. So this maintenance, uh, this global maintenance service contract uh, will consist in the maintenance of all components that will have been turned over to operation. This will exclude uh, design modification and upgrades. Uh, this uh, will include general coordination of all, all involved disciplines and contractors, the coordination, supervision and receiving on all subcontracted activities. This contract will be based on obligation of results principle and we will put a strong incentive to propose any upgrade or modification in order to optimize component safety, reliability or integrity level or make maintenance in a more efficient way. In terms of quantities of components to be maintained, the order of magnitudes are the following, the following ones. So regarding mechanical and metallurgical works, we are talking about uh, 100 pumps. For, uh, we are talking about uh, 250 heat exchangers, 250 vessels and tanks, and around 9,000 manual valves and 1,000 safety valves. Regarding electrical low voltage instrumentation, the orders of magnitude are around 900 control valves, 2,500 sensors, 100 variation frequency drives, 100 electrical motors, and around 50 analyzers. These are only order of magnitudes, but it's just to give a flavor of what we are talking about in terms of component quantities again. Regarding the scope of work, the scope of work uh, is split into three different parts. A first part that will be more or less a, a fixed part, which is composed of staff and logistics and also supporting functions such as preparation or scheduling. Uh, also um, composed of execution of preventive maintenance and inspection works. So these works could be are directly linked to uh, preventive maintenance and inspection programs. And also uh, in this area, we will find all the maintenance activities in link with uh, the operation and general surveillance. Then the second part of this scope is the variable scope part, which is composed of mainly curative maintenance activities of also uh, some coordination activities for some subcontracted uh, activities and also the purchasing of missing general parts or on-call services. Then the third part of this contract will be made of specific orders. Th these orders will be placed, for example, for uh, commissioning assistance activities or in case we would give some modification to the contractor to study or execute. In terms of geographical perimeter, so regarding cryo plant section, um, this is the, the, er the main areas that will be involved uh, in maintenance activities will be buildings 51 and 52. For cooling water system on the right part of the slide, we are talking about building 60s, so 61, 67, 68, etc. And to come back building as well, um, we are talking then about um, the building 17, 13, and 11 mainly. Then now talking about uh, procurement options, which are under review to contract uh, those activities through the general maintenance service contract. So the first option, which is under review, is to have two different lots, one for metallurgical and mechanical activities and another one for electrical low voltage and instrumentation. So to give um, some more details about this option, so we, uh, we imagine to have at the end two different contracts, 
covering maintenance of all continuous plant system conventional components. As I mentioned, one for mechanical metallurgy, the other one for electrical low voltage instrumentation. On top of that, we will have also some other contracts with some specialists, uh, for example, regarding um, electrical high voltage or coal power supply, and this will be tendered separately. Will be part of those uh, two contracts, uh, some central coordination and contract management uh, will be done by AO. By AO. And um, the contracting strategy for non-core services, I introduced before, these non-core services are, for example, scaffolding, insulation, or lifting. Uh, the contracting strategy is still to be defined. Then, second option is to group uh, the two categories of discipline uh, we have uh, discussed previously, and then to have only one single uh, global maintenance service contract. So, to detail a little bit more, uh, this contract will cover again all continuous plant system for conventional components and all discipline, including uh, centralized safety and maintenance engineering method and coordination with some central master scheduling and coordination entity and contract management will remain under the responsibility of ITER. Some other contracts for specialties to be tendered separately. This is the same thing as for the previous option. And again, in that case, uh, we still need to make up our minds regarding the non-core services. So for those, th these two options, option one and option two, ITER will place some framework contracts where the volume will be discussed on an annual basis. The scope of those cont framework contracts will include the activities uh, we define in the, in the slide uh, relating to the, uh, we, we showed uh, before with the three different categories of activities, fixed activities, variable uh, activities, and specific orders. Now I will give a few words about another contract we aim to tender uh, during the mid-term mid period, which is relating to the operation of an announce of building infrastructure and services. So the scope of work of this contract is more or less the same as uh, the one of the current contract we have at this really moment for uh, building infrastructure and services. Um, the, this contract scope is, consists of around 35 buildings, could it be administrative or buildings and warehouses or technical buildings. Uh, the, uh, the area to be covered is around uh, 75 hectares and uh, the organization of work is to be done according to the European and French legislation. Uh, regarding work management. So the technical scope of this contract is split into three different parts. So first part is part A and is relating to buildings. So by buildings, uh, including on those buildings, we have some electrical networks, work networks, we have some other networks such as hydraulic uh, networks, water and gas, HVAC systems, uh, for example, chillers, heat pumps, and so on. We will have also building structure, motorized doors and gates, handling equipment, site infrastructure, etc. Then part B of this scope uh, is made of hydraulic networks and infrastructure. So um, to dig in a little bit more, uh, this, this uh, cover uh, pressurized hydraulic and drainage networks, uh, sewage and industrial system, and demineralized water production. The last part of this scope uh, is relating to soft facilities, soft facility services and waste management. 
uh, in which we will find a building cleaning, pest control, green areas, snow removal, and some other general services. Then, now I give the floor to my colleague Joël that will present you the scope of work regarding the electrical power distribution contract. So I will introduce the scope of the contract for uh, electrical and uh, uh, site distribution. So this is the, the main uh, architecture of the, of the different uh, uh, part of the electrical network. This contract is mainly focused on high voltage. Uh, as you know, the ITER site is connected at 400 kV, so we have several bays, several connections uh, to the French grid at uh, 400 kV. And uh, then uh, downstream uh, on the site, we have a different uh, circuit, different uh, network that we call SSEN or PPEN for steady state power network or uh, pulse power network. Uh, as uh, the previous context of contract, we are uh, under the French regulation, so depending if we are on the work site or if we are outside the platform, uh, we shall apply a different uh, decree, French decree uh, against the uh, occupational safety. And then finally, uh, we have several uh, ICPE installations, so we will uh, see uh, later on. Okay, so this is the uh, general site layout of the uh, ITER uh, site where uh, you can see the main uh, electrical uh, areas. So on the left part you can see the 400 kV uh, substation which is an in front of uh, the RTE substation. Uh, in the blue, in blue is the RTE, is not part of the ITER project, is the interface point. Uh, then we have a 66 uh, outdoor substation and all over the site, as close as possible to the clients, we have what we call load centers and medium voltage switch gears. So this uh, steady state electrical network is for the electrical distribution of all the plant system. Uh, we can consider as a the industrial network of the ITER project. And you can see here in this slide a uh, sort of so a summary of quantitative uh, information of this uh, network. So I will not go through all the lines, but okay, you can have an idea of the uh, install power, which is for the uh, SSEN network more than uh, 240 MVA uh, install power. Uh, today, uh, as explained by Mark uh, before, the electrical system is the first uh, uh, to be uh, in operation because everybody needs uh, electrical power in order to perform their own commissioning. So this is why the electrical uh, system is the first that is now in operation and more than 50% of this uh, the list of components are already installed and in operation. And this is the scope of this uh, operation and maintenance contract. Uh, the second network is what we call the pulse power electrical network. This electrical distribution is mainly related to the machine operation. So this uh, means that it's not yet in operation. Is uh, to this year uh, we will complete the commissioning and it will enter in operation uh, early uh, next year for the first commissioning of the pulse system. The first one will be the AC-DC converters and uh, RPC power. So all the systems that are machine related or uh, linked to heating and current drive or uh, magnetic field are uh, powered by this uh, electrical network. This is uh, the most powerful electrical network of the ITER project. It's more than 900 MVA install power and it will work in a pulse mode, as uh, it is named, uh, linked to the uh, plasma operation. Uh, the scope of the uh, contract, it's uh, mainly for the 
uh, SSCN, PPN. So it's mainly related to high voltage component. We have also some low voltage component, but uh, they are related to the auxiliaries of the high voltage parts. But the core system is high voltage. In the French uh, regulation or French standard, we divide uh, the high voltage in two parts, uh, what we call HTA and HTB. Uh, the limit, the boundary is uh, 50 kilovolt. So we have components that are uh, working at higher level than 50 kilovolt, it's uh, 66 kilovolt and 400 kilovolt, and then another part that is uh, lower than 50 kilovolt, which is the uh, part related to the 20, 22 kilovolt and 6.6 kilovolt for the for the big motors. Uh, part of this scope also, uh, we have uh, all the. INC, instrumentation and control, a link to the uh, electrical distribution. And for the electrical uh, networks nowadays, most of the system are based on IEC 61850 standard and ITER is also designed and uh, built according this uh, standard of instrumentation and control. So it's an important part also of the scope of, of this contract in terms of uh, maintainability and troubleshooting. Uh, of course, we have some transversal tasks that are uh, usually uh, <coughs> requested through this uh, kind of contract, like uh, documentation management, regulatory control, uh, uh, support to the permit to work, site access, all these parts that are uh, really uh, common in uh, uh, general maintenance contracts. We have also uh, what we call uh, worksite temporary uh, distribution, which is historically at 15 kilovolt uh, uh, level because of uh, our neighbor uh, CA that is uh, distributed at 15 kilovolt. So this is why we have also this uh, level uh, of uh, network. And this is uh, the network, the electrical network that is fully dedicated to construction activities. And in this case, and it's also related to uh, all infrastructure that are outside the platform. And uh, this is uh, why we have to focus also on this part because the uh, regulatory uh, rules are not the same outside the platform and inside the platform. And here we will, uh, we are requesting the contractor to take uh, also in charge the uh, loop, com what we call loop configuration, loto management, energy management of this uh, electrical network uh, during the, the construction phase. Uh, finally, uh, we would like also to focus on the uh, maintenance management system that uh, ITER is uh, based on uh, ASAP for many, many uh, parts of the life, uh, the life of the project. And we decide to use also SAP module for the maintenance part. So it's called uh, plant maintenance, SAP PM. And we will include in all the call for tenders this uh, requirement of uh, experience and expertise uh, using uh, SAP PM. You can see here the different modules that we want to implement inside the maintenance management system. And uh, uh, it will be part also of the different uh, contract to uh, initiate this uh, uh, statusing and uh, workflow uh, using uh, SAP PM. Okay, so I will pass again uh, the floor to you in order to make the conclusion. Thank you very much, Joel. So finally, I would like to introduce the schedule and also the next steps. So for global maintenance service contract for a midterm period, first we are going to inter uh, launch request for t information. Uh, it will be launched within a few weeks after this presentation. And then we intend to um, issue a call for tender in uh, Q4 2021. And for the contracts for operation and maintenance of infrastructures and the buildings, buildings and also operation and maintenance of electrical power distribution, we are we intend to um, launch call for tenders between Q3 2021 and Q3 2022. So um, as I mentioned, we are going to um, launch a RFI for global maintenance service contract. 
And as Mark has explained, that we um, came up with the two options, option one and two. And the objective of this objective of this RFI is for us to know uh, which op option is preferred. So if you are interested in joining this RFI, please contact me. And I'm looking forward to um, getting your responses with the justification and, and values of the selected option. So um, I would like to conclude this presentation. And um, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Yo and Joel and Mark. Um, we now turn to the Q&A portion. Uh, we've been seeing during the presentation several questions coming in from you here in the, uh, in the audience participating. Uh, I, I will direct various questions to Joel and to, uh, and to Mark, but also uh, Yo is with us in the studio, so if you have procurement-related questions specifically to procurement, we're happy to take those as well. Some of you may have seen the overview of procurement from Christoph Dorschner yesterday. If you have not seen it and you want to go into more detail about those aspects more specifically, that presentation will be available either as a video or you can look at the PowerPoint. Both will be uploaded today uh, at the end of the, uh, of the two days of the ITER business meeting. So first question uh, coming in, for all of these uh, present systems, what about the nuclear safety INC, instrumentation and control system? What is the status of the design of the INC? So regarding INC, um, the relating equipment or components uh, are not part of the framework contracts we just described. Uh, we have a specific organization in charge of the maintenance of INC. And a major part or large part of the maintenance activity for INC will be insourced. So it's what I can say. OK, thank you. So if we're looking for the instrumentation and control, Keep your eyes on the procurement website. You'll see separate, uh, separate procurements for that area. Yeah. And related to what's been discussed, is there only one GMSC, Global Maintenance Service Contract, to come or several? So the answer is part of the presentation. Uh, we are still investigating. Uh, we are thinking about several options we presented. Maybe we could put some more options on the table, and we will use the outcome of the RFI exercise to make a decision on that. OK, thank you. Um, Mark, if it turns out you want to add something to any of this, let me know. Uh, for, for this type of global uh, maintenance global strategy, do you expect uh, engineering support to the maintenance works to be included in this framework contract? So this is possible that we could need some um, maintenance engineering support, but uh, this should not be part of the framework contract uh, we okay. just presented. Okay, and there's a, there's a related question related to the scope of the framework contract. Since you excluded upgrade and update of the maintenance tools, do you plan to have a dedicated framework contract for that purpose? So regarding tools, if we are talking about uh, IT tools and systems, uh, this should not be part of the contract, it should be excluded. Uh, for uh, the assembly tools, which is quite specific, which is part of the assembly hall and mm -hmm. to come back building, uh, this is something uh, we need to think about. But probably this will be excluded from the, from right. the contract because it's too specific. There's another question coming in that relates to uh, contract scope and what, partly what has already been discussed in the presentation. Uh, when? Can you project when you will decide whether there will be one or two lots? So, uh, yeah. The, there are several possibilities. Uh, either we can decide just after the RFI, uh, again, using the outcome of this exercise, or maybe we could make something more open during the tender process uh, to keep on working on the two kind of proposal at the same time and make up our minds during the selection process. So this okay. is quite open. Yeah. Okay, thank you. A specific technical question. Do you still have uh, specific cryogenic valves to develop for specific needs? Um, I don't think so. I think the development is over, so okay. I would say no. Mm. All right, good. Um, I want to, uh, to bring in uh, Yo Meda for a question. If you don't mind, we'll, we'll, for COVID purposes, bring just the limit of three people on stage at, the, at a time. Um, and, and this is something that, again, could be both Joel and, and uh, Yo answering. And uh, just a question that has come in uh, separately, which is, 
When you look at this overall framework contract, um, and I know Mark as well, you've had experience in this industry and so forth. Are you anticipating, based on what you're seeing, that there's going to be very high levels of competition, lots and lots of applicants, or that this will be sort of uh, more just a, a few consortia or that kind of thing applying for this contract? Mm, that is a good question. That's why, I mean, to know that actually we want to do the RFI as well to see if we have a lot of candidates or not. Uh-huh. Yeah. So okay. the RFI is also to take the pulse of the market. Exactly. And in that sense, to know we the will market figure out well. uh, if there are a strong competition mm -hmm. uh, on, on that topic or on that. So okay. Yeah. Okay, good. Thank you. What about spare parts management? Will this also be included in the scope of the framework contract? Uh, yes, uh, by, by a certain extent. Uh, by a certain extent, uh, we could request to the contractor to supply or purchase for us a few parts. Maybe not some very specific or critical parts, but some consumables or some, uh, let's say, general parts could be bought by uh, the general contractor. Okay, thank you. Um, at present, uh, we've got one more about specific uh, equipment being included. Are the circuit breakers and other electrical high voltage equipments isolating with SF6 gas. Maybe Mark, you can come on for that one. So, this uh, I can answer. So uh, yes, uh, nowadays the, the technology above 50 kilovolt is mainly, I would say 90% on the market is based on SF6 uh, uh, gas uh, system. So all the high voltage component above 50 kilovolt in ITER in the electrical distribution are uh, with uh, SF6 technology. And this may be the question is coming from the fact that there are specific regulation and uh, especially uh, French regulation to comply with for the uh, management of this uh, gas that is considered as a ground, uh, greenhouse effect. Okay. Thank you very much. So at present, that is all of the questions that have been submitted by the, uh, by the audience. We still do have some time. I'm going to ask Yo Meda to come back to the stage once again. Uh, there, for those of you who did not see the Christoph Dorschner presentation yesterday, there was some discussion of the different types of contracts that are there, that what it means to have an open contract, a call for tender, et cetera, as well as Fusion for Energy making a presentation yesterday afternoon about contracts that are uh, uh, put forward by that domestic, the European domestic agency operating out of Barcelona. Specifically to the framework contract, I, I wondered um, if Yo could just explain a little bit how the, the task order system works, how specific aspects of a given contract are assigned to the successful supplier, to the contract holder, um, during the process of a framework contract and during that time. So a framework contract is a type of contract um, which has uh, normally uh, with a duration of three to four years. And where um, the in a framework contract, general terms and conditions are agreed between the eater and also the contractor. And under the framework contract, um, because this framework contract only defines the general agreement, um, we issue task orders under the, under the framework contract. And these task orders are uh, defines the specific task um, technical requirements for each task, and also the the yeah and the details. Okay, thank you. Um, a questions come in. We don't find uh, framework contracts for all maintenance on civil works. Can you explain or clarify how this part will be managed? So this would be maintenance on uh, for all maintenance civil works. Uh. This will be managed, I would say, in a, in a second time. This is not the first priority because the degradation mechanism for concrete and, and structure is, um, yeah, uh, this is, um, yeah, the, the frequency of inspection and frequency uh, is higher than for mechanical or for any other type of components. So this will come later. Okay, good. And I would say for that question, uh, pay attention also to the next presentation that will be starting at 11.30 where we will have Xavier Bravo, uh, who is uh, heading our construction department, as well as um, 
uh, a person from our CMA, Construction Management as Agent, which manages on-site civil works. They may also have some insight into that particular question. Uh, one more, do you, do, you, do you envisage maintenance being carried out remotely through automation? Not in the near future, I would say. Okay. Uh, this is something we can imagine maybe uh, after for first plasma, but um, uh, in, in not immediately. Uh, yeah. No, not uh, for that question, I would also encourage you to have a look at the presentation yesterday uh, and the Q and A associated with the hot cell complex, because obviously, if we're going to use remote maintenance tools, then likely we're talking about something that's connected directly to the tokamak, where the the post-radiation aspects uh, require robotics or remote maintenance. And the hot cell complex was covered in quite some detail yesterday talking about how actually components will be taken out of the tokamak, brought into the hot cell complex where the work on the diverters or work on other components will be carried out by necessity because of radiation levels will be carried out, uh, carried out by uh, robotics. So, um, Question about cost. Have you an idea of the annual amount? I would take it that means budgetary amount for so, for each contract. So, for sure we know our, our budget, <laughs> but in terms of cost estimate, uh, we need to work on that. So, yeah, I cannot confirm any, any figure. It will be not accurate enough. So. So this is again something that Christoph covered a bit yesterday. We, we don't, uh, just because we are a publicly procured organization, we do not share our precise ideas to try to skew the value that, that a, given, uh, a given applicant might make for a given call for tender. So we're not, we, don't, we don't do it in that way. We do put range of values. You can see that on the overall, uh, on the overall uh, procurement website, but we don't issue a specific uh, contract and, and we, we, we take it that in fact the experts in this industry um, coming in by looking at the scope of the contract which is quite or the scope of the, the call for tender which is quite detailed will already begin to look at just based on your knowledge of maybe not a, a tokamak of this size but things in nuclear fission or other similarly complex projects will be able to, um, to come up with that estimate. A question uh, back to Yo uh, or, or for that matter it could also be Joel. Uh, will the task orders that you were referencing be issued only for one year or for the duration of the framework contract? The probably, task orders. Yeah, most probably it will be for one year. Okay, the in task most order cases. will be for one year. Good. Um, is the handling and storage, and this is probably going to ask Mark to come back to the stage, uh, is the handling and storage of uh, SF6 gas included in the framework contract for maintenance? So, <coughs> of course, the handling and the management on site of the SXC is uh, included because it's part of the maintenance activity to make uh, gas analysis and to replace the gas if necessary. Mm -hmm. The storage itself of the gas bottle, here we are uh, with the logistic contract with storage that we can have. Uh, today we have uh, storage in uh, dire facilities that we can uh, use, but the handling and uh, the gas management, because we have to uh, keep update uh, um, uh, register of the <laughs> gas movements, I would say, this is part of the framework contract and uh, fully under the uh, contractor responsibility. Okay, thank you. We have one final question still. Um, I, it's, it's anonymous, but I think it's the same anonymous that asked the earlier question about the overall annual cost of the, uh, the annual amount projected for each contract. And we had said we don't have a precise annual amount, but we will be posting ranges. The question came back saying, in that case, uh, could you tell us what the range is? I don't know if you're able to answer that off the top of your head, that the overall range of the budget contract. Uh, if not, what I would say is uh, continue to write to us. We'll, we'll be happy to to take that question on an email basis, but you will see that when the, as, as the contract is, is posted, you will see the range in there. I, I don't know if anybody wants to offer a, a specific uh, number now. Okay, so stay tuned for that one. So this brings us to the end of this presentation. Um, I wanna thank you all for your, for your questions and, and your enthusiastic participation. Um, also thank uh, Joel and Mark and Yo for your participation and, and the excellent presentation. Coming at 11.30, we will take a little break now, so what you will be seeing in the interim is a slideshow with some of the lovely photographs taken from recent work 
on the, uh, on the ITER site and some of the manufacturing of components. At 1130, we will come back and have an overview of the machine assembly contract strategy implementation. And again, followed by a QA. and a Thank you all very much. Um, we hope you're enjoying the business meeting and, uh, and this uh, uh, interchange. I would also note if uh, we've had questions about the one-on-one -on -one meetings, those have been pretty much filled, but we've had about 200 one-on-one uh, -on -one meetings going on in the background in the uh, either business to business as people are looking for others who might take their services and incorporate it into, into a consortium or maybe checking out who their competitors are going to be. That's one of the nice things about this remote Eater business meeting. So you can see the list of participants as well on the, uh, on the event site. Stay tuned and we will see you again at 1130. Thank you.
Welcome back, everyone. We are now turning to the third presentation of this second day of the Remote Eater Business Meeting. Uh, once again, this presentation will be just a little bit different. We're going to give you uh, an, an overview of the machine assembly contract strategy and implementation by Xavier Bravo and Antoine Calme. The, uh, as with the previous presentations, we will start with a pre-recorded video in which uh, these two gentlemen will, will give you an, an, an overview, and then it will be followed by a Q&A session. So as we start the video, as we go into the technical presentation, feel free to present your questions in writing through the uh, event page. And if you like, you can hold your questions until after, where we will have uh, 15 minutes, maybe a little bit more, that we can, uh, can take questions live as well as they come in. So to introduce our, our speaker, Xavier Bravo is the head of the machine construction department in the construction domain of the ITER organization. His department is responsible for the assembly and installation of the Tokamak machine in the Tokamak buildings. Xavier has a Master of Science in Engineering, and he joined the ITER project about three years ago in 2018, coming from the world of nuclear fission. Much of his career has been devoted to large projects pertaining to design, operation, and construction of reactors and complex machines for science and industry. Antoine Calm is the uh, procurement expert on this presentation. He comes from, uh, he, he is in the procurement and contracts division. He is the procurement responsible officer of our CMA. The CMA is the, uh, what we call the construction management as agent that helps ITER in managing the, uh, the uh, worksite construction and coordination. Um, he also covers machine assembly contracts and is the construction contracts management group leader. Antoine has a master's degree in engineering and management, PMP. He spent 15 uh, years on nuclear project, largely in procurement and project management or contract management fields. Since 2014, he has been uh, at the ITER organization in the procurement and contracts division, first in charge of the Tokamak cooling water system, and then in his present responsibilities that I just mentioned. So I invite you now to turn your attention to the uh, video recording and again, to submit your questions during the recording or after for our Q&A session. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon to all uh, for this overview of the uh, machine assembly contract strategy implementation. This presentation will relate on first a reminder of the contract strategy for the machine assembly then outcomes of the tendering phase from 2018 to 2021, then implementation of major achievement, major challenges and next steps. I will deliver for the contract strategy. Uh, my colleague Antoine will deliver for the outcomes of the tendering phase. Then I will deliver again for the implementation and major achievement and major challenges. And finally, give uh, the word to Antoine for the next steps. Our strategy for machine assembly contract is based upon a work site area approach. Well-defined scopes for each contract, a progressive assignment of works, considering first-of-a-kind assembly and nuclear environment, the need to consider the redundancy of skills and competencies for tokamak machine assembly and tokamak complex, and the situation of multiple contracts with a manageable size. Here is an overview of the concerned worksite area for the machine assembly. It relates to one sub-part of the overall construction site, consisting of the work site 1 and work site 2. As represented on this map, work site 1 consists of the tokamak pit, which is at the core of the tokamak process, plus the large assembly hall site to it, where a lot of preparatory activity are taking place. Worksite 2 corresponds to the uh, tokamak buildings adjacent to the central core process. 
The major related contract for these two work sites where the tokamak machine is being erected are for the work site one, the A0 contract. It is an early works contract for the lower Crowstead part. The TAC1 and the TAC2 contract. TAC stands for tokamak assembly contract. TAC1 deals with the in Crowstat X vessel and feeder activity. TAC2 deals with the vacuum vessel assembly. Then VVW2P, it is specialized contract for the welding of the vacuum vessel. And then a future A61 in relation to the later installation of in vessel components. Major contract for the worksite 2 are TCC0. Again, we have here an early works contract for this area in Tokamak complex. Then TCC1 and TCC2, both are large installation contract for the Tokamak complex, dealing respectively for TCC1 with diagnostic, fuel, vacuum, cubicle installation, specific process room installation in the area of building 14, tritium building, 15, 74 building, which are supporting the uh, tokamak process. TCC2 deals with the installation of TCWS, which is the main primary cooling system, associated VVPSS, which is a dedicated pressure support system, TBM installation, that is for the test blanket module as well as dedicated process in the building 14 and vacuum uh, with the characteristics that main of this TCC2 activity also stands with ESPN nuclear pressure equipment. Here is a more visual view of uh, the display, the localization and scope of activity of the different worksite one Contracts A0 as early works is located in the lower part of the Kraustat. TAC1 is a rather versatile contract uh, moving from in gallery feeder installation to uh, Tokamak pit, Kraustat area up to uh, the uh, later installation of uh, in vessel support, so-called A5 phase. phase. TAC2 contract is uh, specifically focused to the installation of large in-vessel components, especially in relation to the vacuum vessel. As presented already, VVW2P is a specialized contract for the welding of the vacuum vessel and it will later take place once vacuum vessel is completed some specific post installation phase that we call a61 scope worksite two contracts uh, are uh, located in this second larger area the tokamak complex uh, on a general basis, uh, we tend to achieve some partial geographical specification, but it is combined with a specialization by type of systems to be installed, and therefore we have a mixed situation with TCC0 on early works, TCC1 on as presented diagnostics, fuel, vacuum, cubicle, and other supports, and TCC2, more nuclear-oriented, nuclear pressure equipment-oriented. I will now give the floor to my colleague, Antoine. Thank you, Xavier. Okay, um, so today I am pleased to uh, report that we got the job done since we have signed uh, during the last two years the main uh, machine assembly contract. We have signed uh, the four contracts for the worksite 1, A0, TAC1, TAC2 and Vivid W2P. We have signed the three contracts for uh, worksite 2, 
TCC0, TCC1 and TCC2, and all these contracts uh, have been started already. Um, all these contracts uh, are based on the uh, FIDIC general conditions of contract. This is an international standard template for contract for construction. In that case, we have used the so-called Red Book general conditions, which is the one used when the uh, design is done by the employer. We have uh, obviously uh, added some particular conditions to uh, meet the uh, particular features of the ITER project. Um, okay, then, uh, so we have Momentum SNC as construction management as agent and FIDIC engineer. Uh, as such, uh, so the CMA contractor is in charge of administrating the different work contract as FIDIC engineer, but he has also other missions such as the work preparation, the works supervision, the works coordination, the works completion and project control, including contract management. We, uh, we are pleased because we had a good level of competitions uh, based on call for tenders and sometimes we had to uh, go to negotiated procedure uh, looking for further optimization opportunities. I'd like to here to thank uh, all the tenderers having participated to this uh, tendering uh, procedures. It was a long and intense uh, job. Uh, some of them were successful. Uh, congratulations, they were awarded uh, some of these contracts. Some others were uh, not successful, but uh, we took time to debrief uh, all of them upon demand so that they can take lessons learned, improve and maybe uh, uh, be awarded uh, some forthcoming contract, including the A6 uh, scope, which uh, for which the tendering is not yet started. We uh, will come back to that uh, at the end of the presentation. This is an overview of the different contracts that we have signed for the worksite one, and then we will go through worksite two. So for worksite one, firstly we have signed the A0 contract with the consortium led by. KNIM and with MAN, uh, the German company as consortium member, KNIM being a French company. So this is the contract uh, for the early works of Tokamak Assembly. We have signed in July 2018. It does represent more than 50,000 uh, 50, man hours. And so it was started in 2018 and is going to end this year. Next contract that we have signed was the TAC2 contract. We have signed this contract in July 2019 with Dynamic SNC, being an integrated company composed of Ansaldo Nucleare, Ansaldo Energia, Endel, Oris, Simic, Leading Metal Solutions. So this is mainly French and Italian companies. Uh, this contract includes more than 1 million and 100,000 man hours on site, excluding the indirect uh, management hours. We have started in 2099 and uh, the end date is 2026 after the first plasma. The TAC-1 contract has been also signed in uh, 2019, in September. It has been signed with the CNP consortium. This is a Chinese French consortium composed of CNP, the leader, Framatome, CNI-23, ASIPP and SWIP. Uh, this contract uh, is one of the biggest because uh, we have uh, together more than 1.8 million man hours uh, uh, of, uh, on site. It has been uh, started as well in 2019 and the end date is planned in 2026 as well. And finally, for Worksite 1, we have signed more recently the VVW2P contract for the vacuum vessel welding production phase. It has been signed in October last year. It does represent more than 650,000 uh, uh, hours uh, and so starting uh, started in 2020 and end date as well in 2026. For the worksite 2, we have firstly signed the TCC0 contract in December 2018 with Endel NG Consortium. This is a consortium composed of Endel NG, NG Axima, Oris AirTech. This is a French companies. Uh, it does represent more than 100,000 hours. It has uh, started in 2019 and should be uh, ending uh, beginning of next year. The second contract was uh, signed is, uh, that was signed is TCC1. It, uh, it was signed in December 2019 with uh, Ficantieri Consortium. 
Uh, it is a consortium composed of Ficancheri, Ficancheri SI, Delta TI, Impianti and Comes, so Italian companies. It does represent uh, less than 1 million man hours started in 2020 and uh, ending in 2026. And finally, uh, the last one that we have signed is the uh, TCC2. This contract was signed in December last year with Meta SNC. This is an integrated company composed of Ponticelli Frère, the leader, Cobra Installaciones y Servicios, and Empresarios Agrupados International. These are French and uh, Spanish companies. Now I give the floor back to uh, Xavier uh, Bravo. Our large contract, especially for the Tokamak Assembly, feature preparation periods. Uh, these have been now completed on the TAC1 and TAC2 contract, and it is uh, starting for the vacuum vessel welding contract. In relation to this, uh, site facilities have been mobilized. These include large machining workshop for the TAC contract as reflected on this picture, which have been taken from the construction site contractor area. Our contract implementation also foresee progressive work instruction to the contractor. Uh, we do this in the format of construction work packages, so-called CWP. It is the base brick of the contract execution. As indicated on the slide, we have more than 2,600 of such CWP for the full phase one assembly. Phase one assembly correspond to the works leading to the first plasma of the tokamak in 2025. Out of this, 216 CWP have already been instructed to our different contractor, out of which 145 are effectively in progress or completed. Finally, contract implementation feature dedicated training, qualification and tests, uh, such as training for the sector subassembly tool, the opening tool, the sector lifting tool, special processes in relation to feeder weld joint and so on. Here is an illustration of the site mobilization with the corresponding ramp up over the period 2020-2021. You can see uh, corresponding to last April, May, June in the year 2020, a temporary gap uh, corresponding to the impact on the construction site of uh, the first confinement period, which was established in France. However, as reflected on uh, this graphic, uh, the mobilization on site never halted and actually recovered very quickly, a uh, level which was uh, close to expectation. The background in relation to this is that uh, in spite of the uh, very brutal breakdown of epidemics and countermeasures which were taken place by the different countries, especially here in France, uh, the construction site was kept open in all conditions and this was made possible through a fast track adaptation of sanitary countermeasures that we implemented on the construction site and with the industrial partners. This started only a few days after confinement was installed with the request to our contractors on the site to provide their business continuity plan and organize all together with the uh, organization so that we could ensure continuity of works on the site. This enabled key operation to be performed with a minor impact while further development of work could be run under new working scheme 
teleworking for back office, uh, dedicated and progressive implementation of appropriate sanitary measures on the site, and ultimately it demonstrated a very good way to ramp up and pursue the um, quick development of activity on the site. It was all the more important for our project that 2020 was scheduled to be the very year of the effective start of mechanical and electrical assembly and installation works at the core of the tokamak buildings and it is actually what could take place and what is further ramping up now. This slide uh, provides a view of our phase one assembly schedule up to the first plasma. So we're now in 2021 after this effective start in 2020 in a full ramp up and acceleration phase, which is actually settled as pace by the uh, successive delivery on the site of the large components, especially for the tokamak machines, which are being delivered to us by the different domestic agencies, which are part of the ITER project. This notably um, stays for the delivery of the vacuum vessel sector. We received the first sector on the site on last year in August, as well as dedicated magnet delivery, the most representative of which are the TF coal, toroidal field coal. The first of these we actually receive few weeks only after the implementation of the confinement in France last year and we now have on the site six of these TF calls and we are quickly ramping up with the preparation of this in a quasi-industrial approach, continuous approach to work on this. We are now moving to so-called sector sub-assembly, which is preparing the major sub-elements of the uh, tokamak machine built upon the vacuum vessel sector, the TF coal, the related thermal shield. Each sector sub-assembly corresponds to 40 degree and in nine successive operation with a replication effect, we will progressively build the core part of the tokamak. The main assembly is scheduled through a series of milestones which are being carefully looked at by the organization and by the uh, partners of the project so that we regularly progress up to the uh, final delivery of the machine. Here in next slides, a few pictures of achievement uh, we did uh, manage so far over the past 12 months. Uh, this picture corresponds to one of the first and actually major lifts that we carried out. It represents the cryostat base getting lifted down inside the tokamak pit. Uh, here is an other view of this operation which took place in May 2020. Uh, it involves a component of 1,250 tons for a diameter of 29 meters. And one specific characteristic in relation to this project is that project specification requires a very precise positioning, both X, Y direction, but also as regards the angular position, as we have to fully match with the opening inside the tokamak building, the requested level of precision is up to the 
few millimeters, which is a real challenge considering the size and weight of such lift, and it could actually be achieved up to the expectation. It is an operation and activity which took place with the TAC-1 contractor, the CNPE consortium. Here is an illustration of a major, major lift carried out uh, by the TAC-1 consortium. It was in September 2020. Uh, this is the installation in the tokamak pit of the second large part of the cryostat, the lower cylinder. So it's in position since last September. And for your information, we very recently completed the welding between this lower cylinder and the crust base as presented on the previous picture. Here is a third picture showing also from the uh, TAC-1 consortium achievement, the lifting and transfer into the pit of the first thermal shield type component to be introduced inside the pit. It is the thermal shield of the lower cryostat. This operation was carried out in January this year. There is an other illustration of works that are being carried out. Um, it is for the installation of the feeder component. Uh, so these are much lighter, but however, we have a large number of these to be installed with a significant replication effect. These are being installed at our B2 level, which is the lowest level of the tokamak building in highly congested area. And it is uh, definitely a good challenge to master with regard to uh, logistic related transport. And once again, very precise positioning to be achieved for the installation of the component. That one was first of a kind installation and it took place in January this year. Now moving to achievement by the ISA as a major contract for Tokamak Assembly, the uh, TAC-2 preparation, on-site preparation of a TF call, which is a finishing of works that we need to carry out upfront prior to moving to sector sub-assembly with the vacuum vessel. So this was first carried out for TF-12 and TF-13, which will be associated with our first vacuum vessel sector, the sector six that we received on the site. These are being carried out in a specific building that uh, we erected as a workshop to this activity on the construction site, very close to the assembly hall. It is the building 73.2 with a capability to achieve preparatory work on two TF call at a time. The preparation for TF-12 is over. The preparation for TF-13 is almost over. And we are now moving to the second series corresponding to TF Sector 8 and TF Sector 9. And this is work being carried out with the TAC-2 contractor, namely the Dynamic Consortium. Here is an other illustration of works being carried out with the uh, TAC-2 uh, contractor. We need to carry out uh, as a very heavy lifting operation with specific uh, requirement. This one, this opening tool is dedicated to the switch from horizontal to vertical position of the vacuum vessel sector. We are doing this with specific operation process from our overhead crane. It was developed on purpose from the crane manufacturer. Uh, it is especially important for us in the assembly sequence as uh, the initial preparatory works that we need to carry out on the site, for example, for the installation of diagnostics. On the vacuum vessel sector, we have to carry out with sector in horizontal position, and then sector is to be moved in a vertical position and transferred to so-called sector sub-assembly tool, where it will undergo the final steps. 
And this tool is one key component that we need to use in the overall installation sequence. In order to carry out this sensitive operation, uh, which uh, we've been running as first of a kind, it starts with an initial preparatory test and commissioning phase, first as empty commissioning test, then as commissioning with loads. And of course, we carefully run this different sequence upfront so that we can be ready for the very lift itself with effective ITER component. In that case, this is photograph of test which was carried out with load representative of vacuum vessel sector in January this year and very recently end of March we carried out similar operation effective first of a kind with our first vacuum vessel sector the sector six after completion of the horizontal preparation of the sector. Here is a view of this activities that took place for the preparation of vacuum vessel sector 6, uh, which is now being moved for the sector sub-assembly phase. Uh, here is an additional view also featuring our dedicated tool, the sector sub-assembly tool with rotating arms, which purpose is to jointly assemble one vacuum vessel sector, two TF cords, and the related VV thermal shields that we incorporate all together in a sector subassembly. On this picture, uh, displaying one of the two sector subassembly tools that we have on the site in the assembly hall, uh, it is uh, shown the uh, fitting trials that we did with effective thermal shield installation so as to check uh, the capability of our sector sub-assembly tool for very precise positioning adjustment prior we could effectively move the vacuum vessel sector into it. This is again an achievement from the uh, TAC2 contractors, the Dynamic Consortium. On this picture, it is shown more classical piping installation works, but which are also and definitely a key component of the assembly and installation works on this very large construction site. It is display picture of installation of piping by the TCC0 early works contract involving the NG and the ORIS as a consortium. These are pictures which were taken in February this year. We also have some specialized activity as represented on uh, this uh, picture with welding of massive metallical structure acting as penetration inside uh, the uh, tokamak building. Uh, this one corresponds to our port cells, uh, it is massive structure, it is massive welding, these are for the uh, tokamak cooling water system. It is part of the early works activity within the A0 contract which was allocated to uh, Knim and Man. Uh, to summarize of major challenges for our assembly and installation activity. First, and with no surprise, on such a large project with strong technical challenge, our number one is to master the schedule, the costs and the quality in a complex execution environment. Second, we need to pay specific attention that we are indeed achieving together in a collective work between the ITER organization, between the construction management as agent hired by the ITER organization and our assembly and installation contractor on the site. That is the key condition for appropriate agility, capacity to 
optimize capacity to make lessons learned, do better, and ultimately deliver under the target of schedule, cost, and quality. In relation to this, third is the management of indeed first of a kind. It is a key characteristic of this installation, but altogether learning curve. There is learning curve because some activity get directly replicated. As I mentioned, each sector subassembly represents 40 degrees of tokamak to be installed, namely one ninth. It means that sector subassembly activity will be replicated nine times over this assembly and installation phase. And of course, from first of a kind, we want to drag the most benefit about it. It's not only on this case, which is obvious, it is also on more standard installation of electrical, piping, other mechanical works that we have to achieve. Of course, each first operation led to opportunity for the site coordination, for the contractors themselves to improve the process, their pace to deliver, so that we can achieve excellent delivery in schedule and therefore bringing benefit to the cost. It's a challenge then of management of co-activity as this has to be considered for the preparatory activity, um, notably in the assembly hall, in the pit area, but of course and foremost in the overall tokamak complex area where a lot of contractors are being involved. Uh, our organization is especially dedicated to ensure implementation of efficient, reactive site coordination that can foster good management of the overall installation. Next, but key to, to this project is expectation of excellence with regard to the nuclear safety culture. ITER has definitely characteristic of a very large big science project but this uh, reactor is also being built as a nuclear facility under nuclear regulation, under specific related regulations such as nuclear pressure equipment regulation. And we expect the appropriate response capability with all our contractors being involved into the project with regards to the related documentation, preparation with regard to the safety culture approach for prefabrication, for works on the site. And of course, it is expected that it propagates up to the worker acting on the site with a capability for the worker to halt his work or signal everything that he would feel inappropriate when he detects so that it can be reported to the chain and we can process in case it would be needed appropriate NCR. It is a key condition for success implemented appropriately the nuclear safety culture. And last but not least, one major challenge we continuously pay attention to is delivering appropriate well proportionate, efficient and site response to the COVID-19 so that we can move on with our assembly and installation activity all together with the contractors. Uh, we pay especially attention that the biogesture are being applied on the site up to the highest standard so that we keep our site fully available for the appropriate assembly installation as per expected schedule on this project. To give a transition with regard to the next step beyond the early installation of this 
contracts, uh, let me highlight that though the very large assembly and installation contracts, as you could understand, have already been placed, contracted, put to execution, ramping up. We, however, consider two specific additional contracting scheme. One so-called A6, one for the uh, machine assembly related to later in-vessel component assembly before first plasma, with a call for nomination foreseen before end of this year, 2021, as well as a later phase, A6-2, uh, which will correspond to first plasma works, with a strategy currently under development, with a call for nomination foreseen in 2023. And I will now give the floor again to Antoine. Okay, so um, on top of this uh, in-vessel uh, assembly contract, we have other opportunities that we wanted to, to share with you today. Um, so the first one is uh, to uh, work as subcontractors or supplier of the TAC and TCC prime contractors. In the next slides, we uh, have uh, collected the, co the contact points from the different contractors, as well as the main needs that they have today. Um, the second topic and the third one uh, is about uh, the uh, IO contract. The uh, second topic so is uh, some uh, various small and medium manufacturing and installation contracts that uh, we uh, are going to place, most likely, uh, uh, in order to uh, back up or complement the prime contractors. Here we are looking for agility, reactivity, specialized services and works. Third category is uh, various special contracts, supply contracts uh, that are needed for construction. We are uh, giving here a non-exhaustive list of uh, such a supply contract. For example, the supply of high performance insulation materials for the TCWS uh, piping and valves. We have also the uh, supply of upper crest at bellows, magnet instrumentation pressure tran transducers, we have the lower penetration pipes and supports, uh, and as well the CS uh, pre-tensioning tooling. Um, we invite you uh, for this procurement opportunities to look at the ITER procurement website. The link is given uh, on the bottom uh, of this slide. Okay, so if we go back to the uh, prime contractor uh, opportunities, so on this slide, you can find the uh, point of contact for each contractor uh, that you uh, can contact to uh, discuss further their needs and uh, the offers that you can bring. So for TAC1, uh, CNP Consortium Chu Niu Zhang as contract manager. TAC2 Dynamic SNC, uh, you can contact Enrico Salvoldi, project director, or Julien Berthet, deputy project director. Vivid W2P with ENSA, Luis Blancos, project manager, TCC0 with Endel Consortium, Jonathan Parra as project director, TCC1, Ficoncieri Consortium, Fabio Marchesi as uh, proposal manager, and TCC2 with Meta SNC, you can contact David Mokor, the project director. Here is the list of the main uh, subcontracting and uh, supply needs that were collected from these prime contractors. For TAC1, uh, they need uh, some custom machining and special tools uh, manufacturing services. They are also looking for local labor resources and services, in particular in the field of mechanical, welding, lifting, painting, and also some engineers for work preparation or uh, other activities. For TAC2 with Dynamic SNC, so they are looking for uh, manpower, uh, in the uh, field uh, of uh, method technicians, CAD operators, INC engineers and operators, uh, as well as planners and project controllers. The second need is about the construction tools and consumables, uh, such as small tools, parts, lifting items, and others. And finally, uh, non-destructive uh, testing services, uh, including ultrasonic tests, penetrant tests, and uh, radiography, standard radiography. 
for VVW2P with Ensa, so they are looking for uh, workers uh, in the fields of welding, machining using uh, CNC milling tools, uh, computer numerical control milling tools, maintenance and assemblers. They, are also, they have also some needs uh, in uh, non-destructive tests uh, and they intend to subcontract some services for the ultrasonic test, the leak test and the radiographic tests. And the third uh, um, opportunity is for the supplies, such as the welding gas, filler materials, consumables, tools, logistics, temporary, temporary construction equipment, uh, HAC equipment, uh, or waste. TCC0 with Endel Consortium, it's about non-destructive uh, tests, uh, mainly radiographic tests. There is also some needs for painting and scaffolding. TCC1 with the Efficient Theory Consortium, uh, so they need uh, some uh, services and support for the non-destructive tests. Uh, um, uh, some platforms uh, also, metallic structure prefabrication and for piping, spooling. And finally, TCC2 with Meta, SNC, they are looking for uh, support and subcontracting for the steel structure fabrication, for the non-destructive tests, mainly radiographic on site for piping, insulation and painting, and for various services in the field of instrumentation and control, electrical and bus bar. With that, we thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much to Xavier Bravo and to Antoine Calm for this presentation, uh, quite a thorough presentation, I think, on this overview. We're lucky to have uh, Xavier and Antoine joining us here in the studio, and so we will be open to taking any questions that you have. Uh, so far, we've only received one question from the audience. Maybe that's an indication of the, of the thoroughness of the presentation, but uh, feel free to send in any of those live. I'll, I will address the first question to uh, Xavier. When will, we, will the uh, vacuum vessel sector assembly process begin in the pit? And it's a two-part question. Will the French Nuclear Authority have to intervene in that process, and when? Okay, thank you, Levin. So the main start of the VD assembly process in the pit uh, will be with the welding between the first two sectors, sector 6 and sector 7. It is expected uh, early next year, early 2022. Uh, our current activity is uh, dedicated to preparation uh, in the assembly hall, as was uh, mentioned in the presentation. Second question uh, relates to the uh, regulatory follow-up. So um, vacuum vessel and vacuum vessel sectors indeed are uh, safety equipment. Uh, especially they have a regulatory status uh, with regard to nuclear pressure equipment regulation the ESPN level 2 and as such they have a dedicated follow-up. Uh, we are being followed by a dedicated uh, ANB inspector, ONR in French. Okay, thank you. Um, I would just add two things from the communication perspective in, in answering that question. Um, just this week we were, we were beginning the, the first lift of the vacuum vessel sector 6 for the pre-assembly in the, in the uh, assembly hall. So we've been photographing that. Those of you who get the ITER bulletin will probably see some, have seen some photographs uh, this morning in our, in our weekly issue. For those of you from the outside, um, look for our Newsline article on Monday when we will show you some of, the, of the, these photographs of the pre-assembly going on. So the, what happens in the assembly hall is you have these giant subsector assembly tools they have uh, lifted the, the vacuum vessel sector six after its full preparation, lifted that, put it on the assembly uh, tool, and now we will be putting the, the two pieces of the vacuum vessel thermal shield onto there, doing some welding, adding a toroidal, the D-shaped toroidal magnet, the toroidal field coil on either side, two of those. That will represent the full one-ninth, and then that will be lifted, taken in, and we hope by about September or so of this year, uh, depending on, on the precise uh, nuances of schedule, we will begin putting that into the, vacu into the, uh, into the tokamak pit, where now uh, in the pit we're just adding, as you might have heard in previous presentations, the uh, PF round coil, the poloidal field coil number six. Uh, we will be adding that uh, really just in the coming weeks to be followed by PF5 and, and so on. 
So the point that, that Xavier is, is referring to is also uh, an ASN hold point, the French regulatory hold point, which occurs when the welding of two sectors occurs in the pit. And as a layperson, I'm just the head of communication, but as a layperson, I've heard that explained as that's the point when the two vessel, vacuum vessel sectors are welded together, at which it would become too heavy to lift those out. So that is, even though we, on our terms, talk about start of assembly having begun uh, really last summer, the, uh, the, the regulatory viewpoint is that start of assembly for, in terms of the hold point for assembly comes at that point when the first two vacuum vessel sectors are, uh, are welded together. So um, at present, uh, this is the only question we've had from the audience. Maybe that's a testimony to your, your thoroughness of presentation. Uh, our next, uh, we do have another question coming in. Okay, so somebody got one in just under the wire. The TAC and TCC contractors consistently need NDT support, non-destructive testing support. Is this for commodity NDT services or is there a need for testing development and qualification due to this being a first of a kind assembly? Also, thank you, that was a very useful presentation and I really appreciate the efforts to connect contractors to the tax, the Tokamak assembly contracts. So back to the question, is, is there a need for commodity, <coughs> is this for, uh, they need NDT support, is this for commodity NDT services or is there a need for testing development, new test development and qualification because of this being a first of a kind assembly? I, I may provide with a technical view and maybe Antoine you can uh, supplement from the more contract view. Um, with regard to NDT, there is a lot of standard NDT uh, actually being carried out on the site. And as you can imagine, this is already ongoing. Uh, it is correct uh, that we need to look for some specialized uh, NDT uh, with regard to our massive components uh, involving very thick welding. Uh, there has been extended qualification in relation to this, for example, uh, PAUT, uh, dedicated to some application from the vacuum vessel. Uh, thus, uh, and thus we have extended years of pre-qualification behind us. Uh, there may remain possibilities that we will have to go for some dedicated development. In that case, I assume this information will be circulated. Yeah, Antoine? Yes, yeah, so I fully uh, agree with you. Uh, indeed, in the presentation, we've mentioned several types of uh, non-destructive tests, the standard radiographic, but also penetrant and, and ultrasonic. Uh, in some areas, like uh, ultrasonic, we may need uh, more development than the standard radiographic, mm -hmm. considering the constraint that uh, Xavier mentioned. Uh, so I think that both needs are there, uh, mainly perhaps the standard uh, entities and in some cases some specific developments that I believe where uh, DIO uh, will also be involved in terms of uh, collaboration development. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I hope that answers the question. We have another one coming in about uh, just saying thank you for the precisions that were given regarding the IO contractors and, and their support needs. And it's a question maybe partly for Antoine, but maybe both want to comment. Are, do you know, are they looking currently for subcontractors subcontract, sub or local recruitment? Uh, I think there are, there are both needs again uh, here. So uh, some specific uh, services contract with uh, mm -hmm. uh, deliveries, deliverables, objectives. Mm -hmm. uh, but they are looking also for some resources to be integrated in their, uh, in their teams. So I think that uh, we have both uh, configurations there. So the best is to contact them. Uh, and to discuss with, with them to further understand the needs and right. which support uh, uh, can be uh, brought there. Okay, so contacting directly the consortia managing the tax. Mm -hmm. Another uh, comment and question, we are a company that offers industrial measurement. How is the work package A4 metrology activity handled and will this work package also be tendered? So. We can proceed similarly for NDT. So uh, it is indeed a project with a lot of dimensional inspection. It's uh, especially important uh, with regard to the precision targets we need to achieve uh, for proper alignment of magnetic field. Uh, with regard to this, since possibly the very beginning of the project, an extensive effort has been made and 
implemented to have our homemade metrology and it is being managed through dedicated contract framework contract uh, but we also require from the uh, large contractor especially those involved in the tokamak assembly process that they can build up uh, their um, dimensional inspection and uh, metrology capacity so it's neat that you can actually get either from the io in that case you will see possibly through call for tender or dedicated purchase requests which may be made, but also from the two large contractor, the TAC1 and the TAC2, keeping in mind that uh, these are processes which are already established. Thank you. And, and uh, keeping your eye on the ITER, proc ITER organization procurement page, if you go back to the overview presentation made by Christoph Dorschner at the beginning of the uh, two-day meeting yesterday, uh, you will see precisely how those calls for tender and open tenders and other types of, of procurements are, uh, are appearing and how to watch for them, how to, how to see the status and know when to apply. Another question, the existence of several large nuclear and industrial projects, both in France and generally in Europe, are likely to ask for a huge welding capacity. How do you expect to, to secure a sufficient capacity and quality with tier one consortiums for the coming years. Do you have any strategies for this? And thank you very much for your presentation. So mm. strategies uh, yeah. anticipated dealing with the large requirement ITER will have for ongoing welding capacity. I may take one and possibly Antoine you could uh, supplement. Yes. Um, okay, certainly we need to distinguish here between the situation of say classical welding in relation to piping where would say basically it uh, faces similar situation uh, as a large project will face and possible some competition for welding resource that of course we need to look at. Uh, we also have dedicated uh, specialist activity. One of this is uh, vacuum vessel welding activity. Uh, definitely if I take this one, ensuring an appropriate resource capacity has been one key topic uh, which has been handled on purpose at uh, the very upfront in anticipation and it has been a key point uh, for discussion when we went for um, call for tender uh, with uh, regards this dedicated contract. Uh, Antoine, maybe you would like to supplement here? Uh, yes, indeed. So firstly, yes, uh, when we've launched this call for tender and during the tendering processes, we have uh, checked indeed the capacity and the availability of uh, welding resources for the next year. So it was mm -hmm. part of the pre-qualification process. Mm -hmm. uh, secondly, uh, since some years already, DG uh, entered and decided to enter into discussions with uh, the regional authorities, but also many stakeholders like Pôle emploi, etc to anticipate these needs that will be certain mm -hmm. and to set up uh, together with the stakeholders uh, the infrastructures and the training programs that would enable to deliver uh, uh, scrap, mm -hmm. uh, suitable qualified uh, experience personnel uh, available uh, when needed on site. I'm not sure, I'm not fully aware about the latest development and status about this, uh, late, let's say, welding pro program development, mm -hmm. but uh, I know that uh, some, uh, some uh, decisions were taken and, and, uh, and that there is a lot uh, done here. Uh, so this is, yes, I think what, what uh, we can say, and uh, we are monitoring that closely, and uh, yes, we, 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 we have that in mind, we pay attention to that. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So we are at uh, 1228. This brings us to the end of our overall Q&A session and the, and the questions. I'll just mention one uh, more logistical answer that has been uh, for a question that's been asked repeatedly. Uh, the presentation that Xavier, Xavier and Antoine made will be available. Uh, the, you, can, you can go back either to YouTube and watch this whole two-day business meeting or you can go to the event page. Uh, if, you're, if you're on YouTube now, just look for Remote Eater Business Meeting at www.eater.org and that will bring you to the event page where you can see the list of participating companies where you can also see uh, after the end of today we will upload the presentations if you want to look in more detail at a particular slide or diagram or presentation as well as the videos of these recordings. 
Following um, this Q&A session, we're going to take a break now for about 15 minutes. We will start again at 12.45. In between, you will again see some photographs uh, of some of the later, e latest ITER project progress. And at 12.45, we will come back for our final session of the day uh, on the in-vessel coil power converters. And uh, again, with a three-person panel. So stay tuned, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you to Antoine thank you very and Xavier. Thank you.
Welcome back. For those of you who have been watching earlier presentations, and welcome to those of you just joining us. For this two-day Remote Eater business meeting, this is our final technical presentation, uh, which will be presented by a panel, and then we'll have a, a Q&A session afterward, followed by some closing remarks, uh, closing the technical portion of the meeting by, uh, by Dr. Bernard Bigot, the Eater Director General. And then, for those of you who want to stay tuned, we will give you the best rendition we can of a virtual version of a worksite tour, actually getting to, to, to see uh, uh, via some uh, uh, virtual reality to see the, the, uh, the worksite. For now, we're going to a presentation on in-vessel coil power converters. And this is, this is going to be presented by pre-recorded video by three individuals. Uh, Ivani Benfato is uh, the first. He's the head of the Electrical Implementation Division. So uh, that's the division that's responsible for the design and procurement of these in-vessel coil power supplies, as, as, as well as quite a lot of other electrical equipment. Ivani is, uh, is an old timer here. He's been here since uh, with the ITER project since 2006. So that's actually before the ITER organization was actually formally uh, organized. He has dedicated his entire research and professional career to the design and construction of power supplies for uh, thermonuclear fusion projects. We will also have uh, in the presentation Clément Beauvais. Uh, he is a power electronics engineer in charge of the development and procurement follow-up of, uh, uh, of the VS3 coil power converter. He has spent five years in the design office, CAPSIM, C-A-P-S-I-M, five years as project engineer at CERN for uh, moderate voltage substation and high voltage power supply for radio frequency systems. And he's been uh, one year and a half at PPPL, the, the Plas uh, Princeton Plasma Physics Laboratory as a power conversion engineer for the Tokamak NSTX-U before joining ITER last year. Thomas uh, Lagier will also be uh, part of the presentation. He is a power electronics engineer in charge of the development and procurement follow-up of ELM edge localized mode coil power supplies. He worked eight years at the SuperGrid Institute where he had a number of duties. Firstly, he was involved in the topology and control studies of converters for HV high voltage and moderate voltage DC systems, then in charge of detailed design of power converters and the tests and, and their validation. And finally, he managed the pr uh, products maturation and tendering activities for the product power electronics department. He joined ITER just this year. So uh, without any more comment, please uh, turn your attention to the video presentation by these three gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Chairman for the introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to present you the Invesel Coil Power Converter System and the planned procurement of this large system. Together with my colleague, I will give you a presentation which is subdivided in four parts. The first part is dedicated to the overall system description. Then my colleagues will enter in the detail for the all technical parameters of the VS3 and the ELM power converter. And finally, I will come back to you to present the procurement strategy and the business opportunity. The overall system description. So this part de describes the overall system and the design requirements with which are applicable to all power converters, the, both the VS3 and the ELM power converters. So the inverse coil system, this includes two sets of coil. The first one includes 27 coils dedic dedicated to control the edge localized mode plasma instability. Then there's a second system which is dedicated to the control of the vertical position. This system is called the VS3 because it's the third system in the ITER machine to control the plasma vertical position. All these coils are located just behind the plasma facing component and they are used to balance the plasma equilibrium with the fast magnetic feedback control. The main function of the power converter is to receive the power from the AC passive power electrical network and then to deliver to the con as a controller this power to the in-vessel coil. And this is to ensure the plasma stability through magnetic field control. 
In total, we have uh, 25 independent power converters for the Elm coil. So there is uh, one power converter for each coil. The rated parameter of this power converter is 15 kA, 180 volt, four quadrant operation. And then we have uh, one large power converter for the VS coils. And this large converter is designed to, for 80 kA pulse duty, 2.4 kW of four quadrant operation. The AC power comes from the passive power electrical network at 22 kW. So you can see here the bus bar at 22 kW, which supply the whole Elm coil power converter. And the power is, is provided through step down transformer, which are connected to the external uh, 400 kW network. The location. These converters are installed inside the Tokamak building that you can see on these photographs. And when we go inside the Tokamak buildings, they are at the level L4, so above the Tokamak machine. And here you can see the overall vertical elevation. So on the top level 4, there are the power converters. Then there are bus bars on vertical shafts, which connect the power converters to the terminal of the uh, in-vessel coil. And this bar, bus bar inside the vertical shaft are not in the scope of this large procurement. In, on this slide, you can see the overall site layout at the level of four. So you can see the areas located to the power elm coil power converter, and then the, the large area dedicated to the VS3. Among the requirements for the environmental condition, we have uh, the seismic constraint. So the, the, from the mechanical point of view, the, the structure of this power converter must withstand the seismic requirement at the level L4. Then the, 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 the load capacity of the floor has some limitation and we have uh, an allowance of 180 tons for the VS3 converter. And then for each Elm coil power converter, we have 32 tons maximum loading capacity. On this uh, level, at this level, we have also a static magnetic field, which is another environmental parameter for the design of the inverse coil power converter. It is a field that for some of them reach the level of 70 millitesla. There is a water cooling system, which is designed to provide 31 degrees C raw cooling water. I have terminated my part. I thank you very much for your attention. Now I give you, I give the floor to my colleague Clement, who will provide you with all technical details applicable to the VS3 power converter. Thank you, Yvonne. Let's talk about the VS3 power converter. It's a four quadrant power converter used to stabilize the vertical position of the plasma. Two coils are used. They are connected in antiseries to, to compress or to elongate the plasma. To illustrate how it works, I will show you a movie. It's a simulation performed by the physicist to, to estimate what will be the, the current in the coil, so what will be the current of the power supplies. Um, in this movie, the plasma, the vertical control authority of the plasma is shown in purple, and you see the plasma is moving to the blanket, so they are losing the position of the plasma. And physicists did a great job about simulation to estimate what will be the, the current cycle for the power supply. You will see in three slides what will be the current pattern for this power supply. Well, the integration of this converter is challenging because the dedicated space is very limited compared to the rating power of this converter. We have uh, the, the main space that we get, it's approximately 10 meters by 15 meters by 6 meters. And the second huge constraint is the weight. We cannot exceed 180 tons, including all the auxiliaries, the energy bank, I will talk later about the energy bank, but it's 15 megajoule, so it's a huge capacitor bank to, to install in the same dedicated space. 
In addition, we, the seismic constraint should be taken care for this converter. And modular design is expected because we are just over the tokamak machine. So for maintenance or to access in the machine, we need to dismantle all the converter to access on it. Here we have a good overview of what we call the V3 power converter. It is connected directly to the 22 kV electrical network. Um, the charger stage, like the transformer and the rectifier, is included. The energy storage bank is included. And the inverter. And the two additional functionalities are the crowbar system. They are used to protect the coals to, to discharge um, the energy bank and a half scene network. As Yvonne previously told us, the IVC bus bar and the VS call are not in the, in the scope of, of this contract. Here we can see the current cycle for this converter from the load point of view. And it, we have uh, two main scenarios. The first one, you can see a very huge pulse of current and uh, about 80 kilo amps for a duration of about one second. It's in case of uh, losing the control of the vertical position, we can have this uh, very important pulse of current in a positive or negative uh, way. And permanently, the power supply need to compensate what we call the noise. So it's about uh, four kilo amps RMS. Permanently, we should compensate the small vertical displacement of the plasma. So the for RMS current should be provided. For design point of view, the power supply can, uh, should be designed with three consecutive events, like the main pulse that we call VDE. And we have 10 seconds to recharge all the energy in the inside the capacitor to be able to, to deliver the, the a next current pulse. And we can do this consecutively only three times. The other scenario, the physicist can use um, the vase coil uh, with a triangular shape current, and we have a limitation with the IVC bus bar of 15 kilo amps RMS. So we can imagine to have a continuously waveform, as you can see here, or a specific uh, waveform with a higher amplitude, but the RMS current is limited to 15 kilo amps. On this slide, you can see the, the main ratings of this converter. The one important uh, rating is the uh, maximal deceling voltage of 2,400 volts. It's the limitation that we have with the insulation of the coil, so we cannot go higher. Uh, we are connected to the high voltage network. We should respect a power factor of 0 0.9. The voltage response time is less than one millisecond. And the first estimate based on the load impedance to be able to charge uh, energy of the bank, we need to, to get a charger at least of 1.8 megawatt to charge fully to the nominal voltage, assuming uh, 15 megajoules of energy stored in, in the bank. In case of scenario two, it's about 4 MVA. And of course, we, it's very high power, so we have to reduce the dV sur dt in order to reduce the EMC. And we have the, also the contract of the static magnetic field for all the electronics that, that should be studied and take care for to see if what can be the influence on the electronic. Another functionality who is not in the scope, but we will have a link board to be able to connect or disconnect each turn of the VS coil. The VS coil is, is each VS coil is composed of four turns. So we can have um, eight turns and the maximal current will be 60 kilo amp for the peak or six turns and the maximal current will be 80. And the link board allow us to disconnect one turn in order to operate the, the machine with, with a reduced number of turns. The expected lifetime is 20 years of operation and the design should be compatible with this pulsed mode. And we assume that the power, con will, power converter will be at the nomi nominal voltage about 50,000 hours. It's an important uh, 
criteria to design all the capacitor and to reach the expected lifetime. Thank you very much. I'm going to leave the floor to my colleague Thomas for the Helms power supply. Thank you, Clément. Thank you for the, for, uh, to the audience for your participation to this virtual uh, meeting. I'm going to give you more details uh, regarding the uh, ELM power converters, uh, which will be required in the ITER machine. So, and as my colleague Yvonne mentioned, uh, in the tokamak we'll have 27, 27 EML calls in order to improve the plasma stability and the control also. In total, we have three types of calls, uh, as you can see here. So we have the upper, the equatorial, and the lower. And these calls are assembled in uh, sectors, uh, as you can see here. And the tokamak is formed by uh, nine different sectors. Each call is designed to operate with a maximum operating voltage of 200 volt and a maximum operating current of 50 kiloamps. During the tokamak operation, each call receives um, a current reference, which can be different for uh, each call. And this is the reason why we need um, 27 uh, different power supplies. So how will the power supply work? Uh, in total, we have two scenarios. Uh, the baseline scenarios uh, that you can see on the left side on the slide and the updated scenarios. Uh, which will correspond to the future evolution of the machine. So for the first scenarios here, uh, the current which has to be provided uh, is composed by a unique frequency, which can be uh, from DC to 5 Hertz. And for, um, for all the cases, the peak current is, uh, is about 15 kiloamps. For the updated scenario, we have two uh, superimposed frequencies, uh, which are in the range of uh, 0 to 50 uh, Hertz. Uh, but in any cases, the peak current range is uh, between 0 and 15 kilohms. Uh, for the studies and the procurement of the um, power supplies, uh, all the work will be based on the baseline scenarios, uh, which is, let's say, the main ones, while, uh, the s while considering the second scenarios uh, in order to find the best compromise in terms of cost uh, and flexibility. So here you have, uh, let's say, the preliminary technical requirement. Uh, we are still making some um, work uh, with the physicists. Uh, so this number uh, might evolve in the future. However, the order of magnitude should say the same. Uh, the nominal output voltage uh, should be uh, less than 200 volts. The response time should be in the range of 20 milliseconds, and uh, the current to be provided will be um, between 0 and 15 uh, kiloamps with a freak maximum frequency of 50 hertz, and the power which has to be supplied, supplied is about uh, 80, 800 kilowatts. Uh, regarding the harmonic distortion rate, uh, which is an important parameter for the design of uh, the output stage of the power supply, uh, we are still working uh, with the coil team uh, to see their requirement. But uh, anyway, uh, all this number will be validated um, for the, the call for tender. Uh, regarding the input stage, so as uh, my colleague Yvonne mentioned, uh, all the converter will be connected to the 22 kilovolt bus bar, uh, which, uh, which is fed from the 4, um, 400 kilovolt network. Um, we would have some requirement regarding the uh, harmonic distortion rate uh, allowed and the power factor, uh, but we are still, uh, we need to, to perform some study to see if uh, uh, external system will be used to compensate the harmonic uh, and the proactive power, or if this function uh, will be uh, achieved by uh, the ELM power supplies. So um, we are still working on that, uh, but all uh, these requirements will be validated in the following months, uh, and they will be indicated uh, in um, the call for tenders. So now uh, I have finished my part, so I will uh, give the floor to my colleague Yvonne, uh, which will explain you more detail regarding the business opportunities and the, f and the following calls uh, for work. Thank you. I'm back to present you now the final part, which is dedicated to the overall procurement strategy and the business opportunity. So 
the investor coin power converter will include uh, functional requirements which are beyond the common, common in industrial practice. We have a stringent in interface requirement related to the available space, which is uh, limited, the permissible footprint load, the static magnetic fluid compatibility, the supply network, etc. So all these items contribute to make this procurement quite challenging. We have already identified some conceptual powering architectures, but before to finalize the procurement and take a specification, it is necessary to compare and uh, select the best solution for the possible converter topologies and technologies for all key components and devices, example, the energy storage bank of the converter VS3. We also need to consider the current best engineering practice, which are suitable to optimize the ratio cost performance. Therefore, the procurement strategy is planned to be launched according to two waves, two stages. The first one is a number of study contracts for the most challenging components. They will be just a study, not the need to build prototypes. Then there will be two full turnkey system procurement, one for the VS3 converter and the other one for the 27 Elm power converter. For concerning the planned studies, so here we have studies which will be done in-house by the team of the EAT organization and this will be dedicated to the overall sizing and the, the definition of the requirement concerning reactive power, harmonic filters, and so on and so forth. Then there will be the integration in the existing network. Then we are need uh, some studies that we are planning to outsource through contracts with the industry. And these are in the second part dedicated to the identification of the topologies, architectural benchmarking, control strategy, size, weight, estimation. The result of these studies will contribute to define the final requirements that will be translated in the main procurement specification. Concerning the planned study contracts for the VS3 power converters, here the critical components are the energy storage capacitor bank, for which we have a specific study contract already launched, and then we have an additional study contract dedicated to the converter topologies and everything is related to power electronic component. So for this study contract dedicated to the converter technology, as of today, we are considering five different functional powering architectures to be studies compared through through uh, specialized contracts with uh, external contractors. For the ELM coil power converter, here we, we need to compare a number of variants. One is are the switching technologies, so shall we use Tyristor or IGBT. The general architecture of the power converter, the technology for the transformer and the control strategy. We have to select then the, the variants which are in progress and then uh, there will be key performance indicator to assess uh, what is going to be the best uh, solution. The performance indicator for this uh, identif identification of the best solution are the weight, the volume, the harmonic, the production reactive power, the cost, manufacturing time, reliability, maintenance, flexibility, functionality. All this will contribute to identify what are the functional requirement that will be in the final taking specification for the, procu full, the procurement of the full system. So concerning the planned study contracts, so to, here we need to get inputs and we need to get the inputs from different solutions, different suppliers. For this reason, the study contracts are planned to be awarded to two contractors for each study. The current planned study contracts are for the VS3 power converter, one is the dedicated to the energy storage bank of the VS3 power converter, and again, two contractors will be awarded for this study. 
Then there will be another study contract for the main component based on power electronic devices like the AC-DC rectifier, the DC-DC inverter, the protective crowbar, and also this one the plan is to award to two contractors. For the Elm coil power converter here we do not have the problem of the energy storage bank and therefore here we are, we are planning one study contract only for the power electronic devices. Important contract condition for the study contracts. Here, the problem is to ensure that uh, there is a fair competition during the next step, which, i which is the, uh, which are the, the contracts for the full procurement. So, the condition to participate to the study contracts, this is the condition for the selected suppliers, is that uh, the study results of the study contract will belong to the ITER organization. And then the ITER organization reserved the right to attach to any future call for tender the technical result from the study contract. In the case the contractor participating to the study contract is planning to perform the study using background intellectual property or commercial sensitive information that is expected to be kept confidential, these conditions have been declared this background knowledge has been declared soon after the tender invitation. Then the ITER organization will decide whether we can proceed through the offer for the study contract and then accept it. After the study contract, there will be the full turnkey system procurement. This system procurement will include the preliminary design, the manufacturing, testing, site acceptance test, installation and so on and so forth. So the scope of delivery in terms of material will include the power converter units which are expected to be pre-assembled in ISO container frames and this is a requirement to, for easy removal and installing at the level L4 where these power converters are planned to be installed. Then in the scope of procurement there are also the 22 kW AC feeder cable and switch gear. The connecting DC bus bar for what concerns the bus bar is at the level L4. The connection to the cooling water system. Here the scope of procurement includes also the heat exchanger because the, the cooling water that we have available is raw water and instead of for the power electronic devices we need demineralized water. Then there is also the local ANC, the, con the connection to the <coughs> ITER command and data acquisition system. We need also dummy load for testing the power converter before to connect them to the uh, inverse coil. For this large procurement, before to start the tender process, there will be a specific info day that will be organized and uh, all interested companies are invited to attend it. The current uh, overall procurement uh, strategy, the procurement schedule. For the study contract, we have uh, the tender process for the energy storage bank is already launched. For the VS3 power electronic components, we plan to start the tender process in June 2021. The tender process is expected to last five, six months, and then the contract duration will be eight months. For the same type of study contract related to the ELM power converter, so the ELM power electronic component. We plan to start the tender process in September this year. The duration of the tender will be five, six months, and the contra duration to execute the work will be six months. Finally, we will have the final, the full turnkey procurement. Here we have a two large contract, two large call for tender, one dedicated to the VS3 power converter and one to the 27 identical ELM power converter. The two tender process will be in parallel. They, will both, they are both started, they are both planned to be launched in 2023. The duration of the tender will be about a year, one year and then the products need, must be commissioned by the end of 2028. In summary, ITER is starting the process to design and procure a large power conversion system composed of one power converter for the VS3 inverser coil, 
and 27 power converter for the Elm coil. The preparation of the taken specification is in progress. The conceptual study will be conducted by the IT organization and supported by study contract. We started during the third quarter of this year. The full turnkey procurement contract is planning to be launched in 2023. I thank you very much also on behalf of my colleagues for your attention and all companies interested to participate in the planned tenders for the study contracts and then for the full turnkey procurement are invited to get in contact with us. In case you needed to contact us for specific technical questions, here you can see my contact details and then together with my colleague, we will be happy to answer all your technical questions. Thank you very much uh, to Ivani and to Thomas and to Clément. Um, we are very uh, fortunate to have both Ivone and Thomas here with us today in the studio to, to answer any questions that you may have about this presentation. Your questions can be submitted directly on the, uh, on the ITER events page. Uh, so far we have not seen very many, so I'll start with a couple of, uh, of rather general questions. We had one question that came in asking from, uh, from Anita Kulis, asking, uh, saying thank you for the interesting presentations. I would like to know about uh, decisions taken describing the environmental conditions for the project. Is this publicly available and where can I find it? So this is not specifically related to uh, this in-power, uh, in-vessel power, uh, coil power converters. But what I would say about that is that yes, in the beginning of the project and when we were actually clearing the land and so forth, there was quite a lot of consideration associated with the environmental conditions of the project. Uh, what, what measures would be taken to preserve particular habitats, etc. If you write to me at just ETER communications at ETER.org, I will try to dig that study up and see if I can share it with you. I don't believe it's, it's certainly public, uh, it's very transparent, uh, but, it, but it's from that time and we've adhered to that. So there's a new question coming in saying, based on the studies performed so far by the ETER organization, what are some of the most challenging design issues to be addressed for which the ETER organization team would be interested in getting feedback and specific solutions from industry. So you can answer that in relation to the in-vessel coils, but also in relation to some of the broader items under your scope. So thank you very much for the question. Based on the knowledge of the system, what we are developing, etc., I would say that uh, in principle, we are talking about industrial power converter, maybe at the top limit of the capacity performance available currently in the market. What is uh, Beyond the current uh, industrial experience, I would say first uh, is the environmental condition. Here we talk about env environmental inside uh, mm -hmm. the building where we installed uh, the power converter. Something which is uh, uh, peculiar is the presence of the static magnetic field. Static magnetic field is something that uh, in industrial environment, industrial solution, exists only in science facilities like large tokamaks and, uh, for example, accelerators, I would say. Mm -hmm. So, therefore, uh, this is a specific uh, uh, requirement uh, which, for sure, we needed to work in close collaboration with the industry to find uh, a feasible industrial solution. Another requirement uh, which I would say is not new for industry, however, it is a rather high level of requirement is the fact that uh, this, uh, the converters are installed in the upper floor of the building. So the seismic acceleration is relatively high. And then everything has to be pre-assembled in skid so that we can uh, speed up the installation. So somehow the, the system is uh, pre-assembled mm -hmm. in a skid. Mm -hmm. And then we, thanks to the large crane that we have uh, in the assembly hall, we no. can move these big blocks directly in the final position. And this is, is required for two reasons. One, uh, to speed up the, the installation. Mm -hmm. And later, if by chance, bad luck, we have to dismantle. Yeah. So this, I would say, is the two important items for which we need a, a close collaboration with the industrial partner to find the solution. Good, thank you. Um, I would just, we have two questions that I'm gonna combine because they're sort of related to each other, both related to the study contract. 
The first question is, what is your current thinking about the main topics that should be covered by the study contract and which level of detail would ITER expect from it? And then there's another question saying, in ITER's view, would collaborations with universities or public R&D institutes be useful for this study phase? And can universities or public institutes make offers for the study contracts? So that's three parts, but I'll come back to you if you need clarification. So, uh, let me answer the, um, the second one about the, uh, the, the labs are in the universities. Mm -hmm. um, then I will give the floor to my colleague for the first one, which is okay. what we expect from the study contract. Mm -hmm. So collaboration with the um, R&D, universities, labs is a welcome. Uh, however, here the, the big step is to develop a feasible industrial product. So it's essential, to me, it's essential that uh, uh, science lab university works in partnership with an industrial partner mm -hmm. to, to work to develop a stress, a feasible industrial solution. Mm -hmm. Concerning the, what we expect from the study contract, okay, yeah, I the topics and the level of detail. Yeah. So, so finally, what we will expect from the study contract are uh, almost uh, conceptual designs. Uh, we, would like a be, we would like to compare several solutions based on the main performances. And for us, the main performances are uh, the efficiency, the functionality of the systems, the weight, because as you, as you saw, it's an important parameter, mm -hmm. and the cost. So uh, the scope of the study contract will go uh, almost to the pre-industrial uh, pre scheme mm -hmm. uh, determination. OK. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, a question related to procurement and stages. W would any company that contracted successfully for the design studies then be disqualified for, the f for uh, applying for the future equipment supply contracts? Or could they also bid for equipment supply based on their design work? Uh, thank you for this interesting question because uh, it's something that uh, internally I owe we elaborate a lot uh, uh, what to do because to get uh, inputs from industry during the study phase we need an uh, industrial partner otherwise uh, we will not have uh, input from the industry. Mm -hmm. At the same time we are fully aware that uh, um, companies well qualified uh, who has the know-how to participate to the study contract, for sure they will say, look, I'm ready to give you the, uh, my inputs, but then uh, you cannot prevent me to participate to the future sure. uh, competition. Otherwise, uh, I don't, mm -hmm. uh, we are aware about this. So um, there was, a, if you, I remind you that uh, the third, the last part of the presentation, there is a slide, maybe you can go through. Uh, there, there is uh, the condition to participate uh, to the study contract. So the condition is to accept that what is the, the deliverable from the study contract, we can make available to the competitor of the study contract. Yeah. This is the approach we had in mind to, uh, to resolve this problem of the, uh, say, avoiding to give uh, too much advantage uh, to the companies participating to the study contract, mm -hmm. and at the same time allowing the competitors to yeah. participate to the, in a fair way to the yeah. uh, full procurement together with the companies that participate to the study contract. Thank you. And I, I would just note that this is consistent with, uh, with what was asked earlier uh, this morning during a presentation on diagnostics and diagnostic systems, where again, you have, you have a, a study phase and you have a design phase and you have an actual supply phase of the fabrication of equipment. And, and it's the same. You know, ITER, uh, is very concerned with ensuring as a publicly funded organization that we maintain fairness of competition. But on the other hand, we also want to take advantage of expertise that might continue and be useful through multiple phases. So as Ivana describes, we, we try very hard to put in place processes that would allow that competitive fairness to be uh, present, even if you have a company who was involved in the, des in the, in the design study or des in the study phase also then competing for the uh, for the supply, for the equipment. There, there is also another point uh, that uh, uh, our plan is uh, for each study contract to invite uh, two contractors. Mm -hmm. So that we can also have uh, different proposals and then we can uh, 
put together the results and, and prepare a taker specification which will, will be functional mm -hmm. based. Mm -hmm. uh, the taker specification will be, the final one will be based on functional specification in such a way that uh, in principle many companies are, should be able to participate uh, right. to this uh, uh, major competition. Good, thank you. Uh, this is all the questions that we have from the audience at the moment. I would like to turn to just a, a question that's been asked repeatedly in other technical areas, which is uh, both of you, both at ITER and, and in your previous lives, have got quite a lot of experience in this industry. In the, in the types of procurements, coming tenders that you were describing, uh, from what you know about this field, are you expecting a high volume of applications coming in, or is this quite specialized where you think it's going to be uh, you know, trying hard to actually find companies with the required expertise or consortia to, to put these, these uh, bids together? Uh, um, so, we are spending public money. So, mm -hmm. I feel that our role is to create a set of specifications mm -hmm. which allow a competition. Mm -hmm. And to have a competition, you need multiple more offers. Mm -hmm. So. Power converters nowadays are everywhere. <laughs> Even the charger of a laptop is a power converter. Relatively small, I understand. We are searching high power converters. However, our target is to stay within the limit of uh, uh, the industrial feasibility of uh, high power converters. Mm -hmm. So I expect that each ITER member might be able to have at least a couple of suppliers, maybe three. Sure. This is my expectation. Mm -hmm. Then it will be a big competition and mm -hmm. the, the best it will win. Good. <laughs> Good. Thank you. We have a, a question coming from uh, what I am presuming is a younger uh, viewer saying, Hi to all. I was wondering, as I am beginning my engineering studies in France, when will fusion nuclear uh, uh, activities be s d democratized so that these plants will begin to pop up all across the world to produce clean energy? And because of this centralization of focus, uh, possibly engineers like me will be needed. And the answer is, of course, we encourage you to pursue that. What you are seeing globally is that while we are not yet at the stage of fusion commercialization, we are seeing an increased number of these types of research facilities, smaller than ITER. We are already preparing for demo, the, the collective uh, uh, reactor, the, the, first, the first electricity producing tokamak that will follow ITER, and then the private sector is looking at models that have, in some cases, more accelerated timelines. And uh, yes, we think that there is absolutely opportunity. Um, we hope you come uh, apply for a job at ITER because the, 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 the expertise that engineers like yourself will be bringing to the field will be very much needed for, for uh, the, the future build. In terms of commercialization, that has a lot to do with the degree to which uh, investment is made. It has a lot to, to do with whether any of these private designs are able to succeed. It has to do with what we learn from the burning plasma studies that will be possible as part of, of, of ITER. One more question on a technical scale. Oh, go ahead. Allow me on this point. I was, I, uh, ITER is also a large multidiscipline project. Mm -hmm. So for engineers, we are not, okay, myself I have a background in electrical, but uh, we have a colleagues, mechanical, electronic, uh, sure. IT, civil. Mm -hmm. So really, it's a la multiple, multiple disciplines. And therefore, mm -hmm. I think the fusion yeah. is a lot of opportunities. Exactly. Yeah. Material yeah. science, cryogenics, and, and even the support functions. We have, of course, accountants, communicators, writers, uh, many people in, in law or in procurement, as you've been seeing in some of the uh, presentations. Yeah, you see, we have also Contracts yeah, management, yeah. et cetera. Right. Junior so. engineer that joined yeah. recently. Exactly. Good. <laughs> Uh, so, a technical question. Presumably, the ELM power converters contract would expect a first of series prior to following series production of the 26 times uh, uh, identical systems. Can you confirm that that's the case and that the expected contract duration would allow both the first of series and then the series production? This has to be defined uh, in, in it, inside the inter organization. Uh, we have just started the studies of, the, of these converters, so this is something we, we, we need to be uh, we need to consider. But I think yeah. we start with the first like, like series. Like any product which is yeah. multiple identical unit for sure. Mm -hmm. We do first uh, the, the unit number one. Yeah. yeah we yeah. do the old test. 
they would. And we've seen that actually. We're seeing that both from the from the elements that ITER is procuring directly, the ITER organization, and also the domestic agencies, those that go through prototyping series and then, yes, they will do a first of series production and then do the, the, do the overall identical pieces. So while that's yet to be determined specifically for this, we've got previous experience in doing um, exactly that. Thank you very much. We have now come to uh, 12.30. This is the end of our, of our Q&A period. I would like very much to thank Ivone and uh, Thomas for your, for your uh, presentation as well as being available here for the, for the Q&A session. Uh, we're going to take a short break, and at about uh, 45, uh, uh, 12.45, we will come back, sorry, 13.45, we will come back to hear some closing remarks from the ITER Director General. And then I would also note that at that time, uh, we will have the, the, uh, a work site tour. That will conclude the formal process, but I will try to take you on the best version that I can of a work site tour. Also, in relation to a question that we saw by the time that worksite tour is finished, uh, so probably an hour and a half or something from now, by the time that that's all done, you will be able to see the presentation from Yvonne and Toma and Clement, uh, Thomas and Clement, as well as uh, all the other presentations, both the PowerPoint files or the, the PDFs of the, of the slides, as well as the videos, if you would like to watch again. And that will include links, contact details, et cetera, for further follow-up. I want to thank you all for your participation, and um, we will be back to you very soon. Thank you.
Thank you once again uh, to all of you who have been participating over the past two days. Uh, I think that we learned actually quite a lot here about remote presentations and interaction. If anything, in contrast to our normal uh, ITER business forums that occur uh, every two years, we probably had as many people or more tied in and maybe even more conveniently tied in from different parts of the world. Uh, we, we saw that participation. We had thousands of people viewing at, uh, the, at, from time to time the YouTube stream and, and at any one time uh, between five and 600 for some of these individual presentations. Your questions were excellent. They were your suggestions as we hope for were also innovative. So this brings us to the, to the close of the ITER, uh, remote ITER business meeting. I will uh, turn the floor over for some final remarks to the ITER Director General, and then we will follow that with an ITER worksite tour. So please welcome Dr. Bernard Bigot. Thank you very much, Leban, for these uh, last words. So ladies and gentlemen, dear colleague, as you said, Leban, we are now coming to the close of this two days remote ITER business forum it is indeed my pleasure to report to you that from every, every indication, our meeting has been an excellent success despite the um, restriction of meeting virtually. I would like to thank all the presenters as well as those of you who have participated in the Q&A session and the many one-on-one -on -one meetings. In fact, as we saw evidently, from the participation to various sessions, a virtual event has some benefit of allowing many new partners from other countries to attend. We are looking forward to seeing you face to face next year, 2022, in the ITER Business Forum in Marseille. Based on our experience this week, we may try to add a virtual or hybrid dimension to the forum next year. In particular, we have seen excellent discussion responding to the IO and FRE presentation on the Trisham plan, the hot cell complex, some of the diagnostics we will be procuring, the coming framework contract for maintenance service, and many other important topics. More than ever, we are seeing the value of a strong dialogue among our partners, including suppliers and potential suppliers. We have seen today and yesterday the benefit of the IT organization having a chance to listen to your questions and ideas, including your suggestion for innovation in how to proceed to be always globally more efficient. As always, we value a lot your business. For a project with this exceptional specification and remarkable complexity, it is essential for us to completely identify and obtain strong industrial partners committed to deliver safely on quality, on specification, on cost, and on time. Your strong performance, professionalism, and commitment has been at the root of our success, even more so during the challenge of the past 12 months. We could not do this without your help and without a common understanding of the unprecedented values it represents to deliver to future generations a source of energy that is massive, continuous or time modulated to complement renewable energies as needed, environmentally friendly and virtually unlimited. I hope that through this meeting we have attracted still more industrial partners who will share this vision and work with us side by side in the months and years to come. As you know, we are committed with your help to continue moving forward with the same determination. Thank you to all of you who have made this meeting so successful. And I hope I will see you in person quite soon once COVID has left okay, the uh, imp implementation uh, of the uh, ITER site as it is now. Welcome back everyone. The, the formal portion of our program has closed with the remarks of the Director General, but as you have seen on the schedule we have one more feature for you. We are going to take you for the next 20 minutes or so into a virtual tour 
of the, uh, of the Eterworks site and try to take you inside some of the buildings and scenes so that you can get a feeling for the complexity and the scale and the scope of the ITER project. So we'd like to begin this by taking you on a recent drone video.
So that drone video gives you a bit of an overview of the ETER worksite from just uh, a, a few months ago. What I want to show you now is to try to take you into some of the uh, more specific aspects where we've taken 360 degree photos and uh, we'll do our best to give you a virtual tour. Obviously in an ideal world COVID would not be here and you would all be physically able to take a tour. Uh, we hope that by the time of the next ETER business forum, this time next year in Marseille, that we will be able to welcome you here and do that. But for now, um, we'll do the best that we can to give you this impression. What you see in front of us from the top down is the ETER worksite. It's about a kilometer long and about 400 meters uh, wide. And uh, we will try to take you inside some of the most critical, we won't go through everything, but some of the most critical buildings. If we tilt this picture just a little bit, you can also see the, this, the, uh, the overview and the environment that ITER is surrounded with. We are very fortunate to be in this beautiful part of, uh, of Provence where we are uh, ringed with mountains and in a very beautiful natural setting. Also the uh, right next to the CEA uh, research, French research uh, facility here at Cataraches which provides uh, very, very good uh, complementary work, some of it directly supporting ITER. So now let's start by going into the electrical switchyard. Um, we'll take a look at the, uh, the, the, the two electrical power systems that ITER really has. The first one, which has been commissioned actually for, for about two years, uh, takes the electricity from the French grid and powers everything here at ITER, including uh, the building from which I'm leading this tour. That's a lot of uh, US supplied equipment. The second part uh, is the, the second system uh, is called the Pulsed Power Electrical Network. It includes what we, incl what we call the reactor power compensation uh, with a lot of trans the transformers supplied by China, a lot of equipment supplied by China and others. And that, the function of that electrical system is to take the incoming AC power and convert it to DC power in a manner that can be pulsed. So we call it the pulsed power network in a manner that can be pulsed uh, for exactly the right uh, power to the, to the ITER superconductor magnets. So uh, at the top of the screen now, you see these magnet conversion buildings. That's where the power actually goes. And so following a logical order, we'll try to go there uh, next. If you look at the exterior part of the magnet conversion buildings, you will see the, a lot of equipment installed there in the bays. This equipment is coming from Russia and India and Korea and, and uh, China. And, and we have, um, we'll go now inside those buildings the, the exterior and interior has a combination of transformers, thyristors, uh, all of the equipment needed, the electrical equipment needed to deliver the, the power at the proper voltage and amperage. And it may seem like a simple thing to do until you start considering the actual size of ETERS and complexity of ETERS magnet systems. These yellow pieces that you see here, they're all through the, the magnet conversion buildings. These are bus bars, largely supplied by Russia that uh, will go not only here, but also inside the tokamak complex, carrying it right to, carrying the, the uh, electrical current directly to ETER's magnets. Next, we want to go to the, also a magnet support system, which is the, uh, the second major one, the, the cryogenics plant. The cryo plant, you can see here with the uh, large tanks uh, right next to me here, that, that you've got the, the, the helium, the liquid helium tanks that will, um, cool ETER uh, 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 magnets by running a, a little um, uh, tube through the middle of all the magnets that cools them down to minus 269 degrees. Why? Because with the niobium tin and the niobium titanium that make up these magnets, in order to be superconducting, to get to a point where there is no resistance, they must be cooled to about four degrees Kelvin, almost the temperature of interstellar space. If we go inside the cryo plant, we can see that uh, a lot of equipment that more or less looks like if you open the back of your refrigerator. It's a lot of pipes and, and valves and tanks, compressors uh, that, that uh, essentially um, take the, uh, the, the helium, liquefy it, and, and take it to the, to the right temperatures, as well as liquid nitrogen, um, which will uh, also be used in some, in some cooling environments. This is the largest, largest single platform cryogenics facility uh, in the world. So. I'd like to, um, having talked about the support systems for the magnets, I'd like to show you some of the magnets that are actually being manufactured here on site. 
What you see, the building uh, here in front of me is a, a, uh, the, the PF coils building, poloidal field coils building. So our magnets are being made largely in factories all over the world, but when you have some that are simply too big to actually be shipped to come to ITER, and we'll show you some of these going now inside the poloidal field coils building. The largest of our ring-shaped magnets, this is an example here, 24 meters in diameter. This is PF4, uh, currently in manufacturing. It's manufactured in a series of layers. The, the, what you see here is a flat pancake, uh, is what we call it. It looks a little bit more like a very thin bagel or donut, but it is made in a series of these windings uh, in a flat way, and then the pancakes are stacked on top of each other. And it's all in kind of a linear production mechanism. If you turn the photo and look all the way down, you can see that one piece after another, it goes to various stages where the magnets are stacked where we add the thermal, the, the resin impregnation to make it into a solid stable unit, where we add other clamps around the outside, and eventually where we cryogenically test the magnet to be sure before installation that it is uh, manufactured to oper operate properly. We're now going to take you actually inside one of the magnets. The, the magnet that I was just showing you is 24 meters in diameter. This one is PF5. 17 meters in diameter, slightly smaller, and nearly completed. You can see as you look at it that you have the, the various pancakes all stacked into a single magnet and the clamps and so forth put around it. At this stage, uh, PF5 was ready for cryogenics testing as the, as, the, uh, as the next stage. And in fact, we already have a magnet um, that is ready to be installed, PF6, procured by Europe in China. And uh, PF6 was about 10 meters in diameter being shipped here was cooled here in this facility. And in Russia and St. Petersburg, PF1 is nearing its final stages. So PF1 will be the last of the circular magnets. Uh, we also have two other magnet systems that I will mention uh, in a moment. But all of these magnets then go out of this facility across the ITER worksite, make an L turn, and go into the back of the uh, assembly hall, which is uh, the, the building where uh, I will take you next. So. In the assembly hall, uh, we have um, a large uh, area that is operated under a very, very clean environment. If we uh, turn to look a little bit, we can see that in the foreground, you've got various components being prepared to all be pre-assembled before they actually go into the tokamak facility, into the tokamak pit. So you see the very shiny ring there, uh, just, uh, just down here. This is, the, this is the thermal shield for the lower cryostat cylinder. So the cryostat is the large thermos that goes around everything. You'll see pieces of it very shortly. We have two types of thermal shield. This thermal shield, and then a little further over, you have the vacuum vessel thermal shield. So two different, very thin, silver-coated pieces of metal that will shield various portions of the magnet. Uh, and the environment. And, and these are all assembled uh, using these, these overhead cranes that will pick up each piece, carry it across, and put it into the tokamak pit, as well as on the left you see uh, to the, the subsector assembly tools. So the tools there will be able to pick up a section of a vacuum vessel, integrate it with a second magnet system called the toroidal or the D-shaped uh, magnets, as well as a vacuum vessel thermal shield, make it into a single unit, pick the whole thing up, and with these overhead cranes, take it all the way into the uh, tokamak pit. I'd like to now take you to see a section of the vacuum vessel. The very first vacuum vessel sector that we had arrived in, uh, in uh, July, August last year from Korea. And since that time, it has going, been going through various preparation stages. You can see as you look across it that it's got various bosses that have been put on there for connection points, as well as uh, diagnostic uh, piece, uh, places where diagnostics that will analyze the, the plasma uh, are integrated. We'll now do something a little bit strange. We'll take you one step further. This is something that you couldn't actually do if you were here. This 360 degree photo takes you actually inside the, the vacuum vessel sector, PF6. So this is a little bit what it feels like to be a neutron or a subparticle uh, inside the, uh, the ITER plasma. The ITER plasma will be contained within this. When we put the, the vacuum vessel sectors all together, the nine sectors together for first plasma, 
These walls will largely look like this. We won't have all of the, uh, the blanket, the, the coatings, the, uh, the first wall components until after first plasma, after we get a chance to test and see that everything is in fact functioning correctly. So lastly, I'd like, you take, like to take you directly into the tokamak pit. We go there through this corridor, which is a uh, part of our necessary clean environment that takes you from the assembly hall into directly the, uh, the tokamak pit. That will be our, our final stop on our virtual tour. So here in the tokamak pit facing downward, you can see that there is the cryostat base. The cryostat base uh, is the, the largest and heaviest component put into the ITER uh, system. The cryostat overall has been manufactured in India in, in 56 pieces, shipped individually. And if you look down at the bottom of the base, you see these lines that sort of go out in pie shapes. Those lines are welding lines because to give you an idea of ITER as an international system, uh, the, the various pieces arrived here in ITER into a, a workshop owned by India, were transported from India, and then a crack team of German welders under nu Indian uh, supervision, under French nuclear safety regulation, put all this together on an international site into four giant components. So the first one, as I said, is the cryostat base. Sitting on top of the cryostat base here, you can see the lower cylinder, just a 10 meter high, 30 meter diameter ring. And at the time of this uh, uh, 360 degree photo, we were still welding the, the, the uh, cryostat lower cylinder to the cryostat base, 90 meters of welding, some of it in very tight circumstances where it needed to be done half by humans, half by robot welders, uh, and that gives you a bit of the complexity. As we go around the circle, you also see all of these openings. ITER is quite challenging, more challenging actually than a, than a uh, future commercial facility will be because we have so many diagnostics and interfaces. So all of this will be a completely sealed chamber. It must, must all be leak proof. But through this, you will have the various heating systems coming that will power ITER. Now, since this photograph has been taken, there's been a little bit of additional work. We've put the support pedestals in that will support PF6 at the bottom, uh, where the, the first magnet, the first ring-shaped magnet will go. We've also started to install the, uh, the, the, the supports for PF5, and we've put a mock cylinder in the middle as a support system to start installing other pieces. That will be eventually replaced by the central solenoid, the last of ITER's major magnet systems, that together with the ring-shaped uh, poloidal field magnets and the, the D-shaped toroidal field magnets will be uh, creating this invisible magnetic shield, uh, a magnetic cage inside the steel cage of the vacuum vessel to house the ITER fusion plasma and uh, uh, create the, the environment in which uh, full fusion can take place. So, that concludes our virtual tour. Um, once again, I want to thank all of you for coming here to the, uh, to the last two days of the ITER Business Forum and for uh, helping us to explain or listening to us, talking to some of your counterparts to explain some of the upcoming procurement activities. We hope that many more of you can join us as suppliers of this in, uh, unique international science research collaboration. Thank you very much.